What's going on guys? This is Rob. And after finishing up Spider-Man, I was like, you know, like let's 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 find something else to cover, right? Something else to to go over here. And that's one of the struggles as a comic book YouTuber is you kind of find yourself in this position from time to time where you get so caught up in a story that you're reading that it's kind of hard to forget there's still like a mountain of other stuff there. And Devil's Reign is one of them. This story is amazing. Okay, so it's basically the return of Kingpin. Not really the return. It's Marvel actually doing something with Kingpin now uh, as opposed to, you know, like, you know, King's Ransom or whatever was so here's the thing right this story kicks off about a week ago and it basically picks up with daredevil as you would expect because kingpin was originally a daredevil villain so marvel's had really in recent years kind of taken him back now one of the things that i do want to establish here is that right now kingpin is basically the mayor of new york city now for those of you guys who aren't really familiar with this this has been going on for quite some time and it all really goes back to secret empire right so secret empire of course was a story that we covered where basically the red skull used a cosmic key to change Captain America's history uh, and that basically led to Captain America becoming what was essentially a Hydra agent and then conquering North America with his sight sets on the world although ultimately you know he was defeated before he could do that and so the way this played out is that one of the things that had happened is that New York itself was basically encased in living darkness right technically it was called the dark force but it was essentially just covered in like encased in darkness so no one could get in and no one could get out what you did have was a character by the name of Dagger who had the ability to emit light and she was literally tasked with standing at the top of the Empire State Building and just lighting the place up. Now, by and large, people did what they could where they could, and heroes that were stuck there were trying to find a way out and trying to find a way to save the world and all that kind of stuff, or at least save, you know, their city and so on and so forth. But on the street level, on the ground level, the average person living in their homes with no idea what was happening, they had to deal with being robbed or, or you know, all kinds of different criminal actions that were going on. And so what the Kingpin did is he actually stepped in and essentially served as a protector for the city of New York. Now, make no mistake, he knew what he was doing. He knew that in doing so, it would rally the support of the people so that when the time came when New York was freed from, from its dark force encasement and basically everything went back to normal or at least as normal as you can get in Marvel Comics, Kingpin ran for mayor and the people elected him, right? Because basically he was the one that kept them safe when they had to worry about being robbed and all that kind of crazy stuff. Now, the other part of this equation, and this is what he's talking about when he's speaking with Daredevil, right? That when he's kind of talking to him and whatnot, that he knows is that in his vault was basically the secret identity of Daredevil. But when he went through it recently, that identity was gone, right? He doesn't know what in the world's going on. He's essentially lost his knowledge of Daredevil's identity. That actually goes back to Daredevil with issue number 20. Really, it was volume five, issue number 20, but basically the Purple Children. So the way this worked, you guys have all heard of the Purple Man, Zebediah Kilgrave. One of the things that he had done is he had basically traveled around really the, you know, North America and the world, finding all these different children that he had fathered when he was being a sadistic person and the goal was to actually conquer various countries around the world with his children running those different countries or those huge sections of the world and then they would all basically report to him once the children were all gathered together they realized that they had the power to topple Zebediah Kilgrave which they basically did but while this was going on Daredevil was actually traveling around trying to rescue them keep them safe different things like that the idea of Kilgrave was to eventually take their their powers kind of hook them up to a machine and use that machine to basically amplify his own ability and then effectively conquer the world. And where all that was basically done, one of the things that happened that Marvel had done is they had basically had this circumstance set up where the machine was used to make everyone forget that Daredevil was Matt Murdock. They literally one more dayed his storyline. <laughs> I mean, I don't really know if people were upset by it in all reality. I had, I actually had to go back and read that. I hadn't really been keeping up on Daredevil recently, but that's really how all this really kind of picks up, right? The things that are going on that are kind of leading into this. Now, the fact that Kingpin doesn't remember the identity of Daredevil is not the biggest thing in the world. Instead, what actually happens is Matt torments him, right? Matt makes fun of him and kind of pokes fun at him. He's like, hey man, like that's why it's called a secret identity because you're not supposed to know. And Kingpin actually takes this as a personal vendetta, right? He takes this as a personal personal affront. And so following that, what he does a week later is he steps out in front of the mayoral office in New York, holds a press conference, and basically civil wars the place in the sense of saying that like all superhumans out there are basically outlawed. Anybody out there who is operating as a superhero, that's a problem. And it's interesting the way that he does this, right? Because for the most part, people can think for themselves, but they usually choose not to. They usually just choose to allow a person in authority, tell them what to do. And rightfully so, right? It's easier to do what you're told than to kind of like try to figure it all out for yourself. And so because of this, Kingpin stepping out here and with people trusting him the way that he does, he says like at the end of the day, like we've suffered wave after wave of attacks, right? Of destruction brought down on our great city. And at the heart of almost
almost every single one of those are superheroes. That yes, we could look at villains and we could say villains do bad things and we deal with them accordingly. But the reign of aliens that descended down on our city, Spider-Man originally brought them here. Of course, he's referencing the events of King and Black and saying it all goes back to Peter Parker. That the hordes of trolls and ice-strewn beasts that destroyed our homes, that's because we brought Thor here, right? That was the War of Realms. The idea that like the frost giants and all, all that kind of craziness and chaos eventually found itself on the doorstep of Earth, specifically in the city of New York. And what he says here is, there's a saying, follow the money. But with these tragedies, it's instead, follow the destruction. And you'll find it leads back to these heroes. We allow these unnatural monsters in capes and bright colors, free reign in a city of good people, people trying to live their lives. And when we dare hold them accountable for their crimes, like with the murderer Daredevil, they get preferred treatment, a slap on the wrist. And then they're free to go, to do what they've always done. Whatever it is that they want to do, terrorizing, violence, destruction. And that's one of the things that's kind of the nature of this, right? The question here is, is the juice worth the squeeze? Is the collateral damage that we experience as a city worth having these superheroes? Or would we just be better off without them? And so he says, we here in New York City feel that is not enough. Over the last few weeks, I've been working with lawmakers to draft the Powers Act. Recently, our friends of the federal level wisely outlawed unsanctioned superhero activity for those under 21 years or age. And so he in turn says, we're expanding that, right? We're basically outlawing superhero activity at all here in New York, unless it's sanctioned. So in a lot of ways, this really is the Superhuman Registration Act from Civil War. It's renamed and it's largely being confined in the city of New York, but it's cool because if I'm being honest with you guys, as much as I loved the Civil War event, I kind of think this is a little more interesting because it brings things kind of closer to home, right? One of the first questions that people ask is like, is the rest of the country going to follow suit? Are other cities going to follow the same process? Remember, with the Superhuman Registration Act, it was just a nation wide crackdown like that, right? Just day one, everyone has to register. With this act, it's a little more extreme. And even Tony Stark says that, right? He's like, we've been down this road before. Superheroes serve a purpose and have saved not only New Yorkers, but the world many times over. This is a desperate move from a gangster mayor in an election year. Even Krakoa steps in, right? And like Storm steps up and says, look, Krakoa doesn't really care about law, about man's laws, right? So do not mess with us and we will not mess with you, right? Mutants everywhere have diplomatic immunity no matter where they go. And so that really supersedes anything that the city of New York is doing. But rest assured, if a mutant travels to New York City and they are arrested by the forces of Wilson Fisk, there will be hell to pay, right? I mean, it's just, that's kind of the stance of Krakoa, which is really cool. And then following that, the first wave of arrests begin for those individuals who basically just refuse to, well, to register, if we're going to call it that. And of course, Moon Knight's the first one. <laughs> Why wouldn't it be Mark Spector, right? I mean, the guy's like, the guy's Marvel's Batman. I mean, of course he's not going to register. But then from there, you actually end up getting what's essentially the Thunderbolts, right? And that's what we're just going to call them. I mean, they're kind of the newly formed Thunderbolts here, right? So like Rhino, US Patriot, and it looks like Shriek. And then of course, like the female Electro, Maxine. So like you have like these, these, you know, kind of superheroes who are here, but they're quote unquote registered. And that's why this event is very reminiscent of Civil War. And I'm sure those of you guys who read Civil War are like, okay, so it's basically just Civil War on a small scale and you're not wrong <laughs> <laughs> you are by no means wrong because even during the Civil War event, the Thunderbolts were the group that were tasked with like going out and like breaking laws if they needed to in order to get their hands on people who were refusing to register. And that leads into the introduction of Captain America, right? Who basically tells these cops, these enforcers to essentially lay off and that where they refuse to do it, then everything kind of starts to pop off here. Now, of course, Captain America steps in to basically save Miles Morales. Of course, Miles has a new costume, which looks dope. I'm not even gonna lie. We need to get caught up on Miles comics, right? Like I love Miles Morales and I'm never going to get used to Miles being in the, in like the main Marvel universe. So seeing like Captain America come to his aid, right? Like the main Marvel universe, Steve Rogers, it's, it's always going to be new to me, right? It's always going to be cool to me. Like it's just, it's, it's one of those fun little things, but it's kind of interesting, right? Because this is one of those instances where Captain America, very reminiscent of civil war. Of course, Tony Stark really seems to be on his side too, but Captain America's response here, like where the, where the guards tell him like, you know, like you're under arrest too, Cap, like every one of you guys are under arrest and Captain America is like, okay, I mean, that's cute and everything, bro. Like, I totally understand you, your belief that you can arrest me. And, and that's adorable, right? It's like a little kid sitting on Santa's lap saying what it is they want for, for Christmas. You know, it's cute and it makes for a good picture. Let's be honest with ourselves, man. There's nothing you can do to me here. Like, I will absolutely beat you to death before that happens. I mean, you won't, but like, that's kind of his stance. 
And so in this conversation, one of the guys says like, well, I mean, this guy is a criminal. And the response of Captain America is if, if a law needs to be broken in order to save lives, I'll do it every single time. And so ultimately the other guys are like, no, you guys are all going in. And so of course, Captain America helps them to understand their place in the bigger picture by cracking them over the head with his shield, which is always the best answer. Like I always tell you guys, violence is not always the answer, but it is a answer. And it's usually a very effective one, right? Violence gets things done. And Captain America understands that, right? Like Captain America understands violence gets things done. I mean, are there gonna be problems? Sure, but it's an answer. <laughs> so sometimes you just gotta, well, at least no pun intended, roll with the punches, you know what I mean? <laughs> But at the same time, you've also got like Spider-Man and Daredevil who step in. So in a lot of ways, it's a coming together of the superhero community standing directly against Wilson Fisk. Now, of course, they end up basically kind of going to an underground lair. And that's when the questions start getting asked, like, why is Wilson Fisk doing this? And initially, Matt Murdock steps up and says, actually, it's my fault. And, and the reason he really takes the blame on this is one, because of what we saw in the beginning with regards to the fact that Wilson Fisk knew what Daredevil's identity was, but Daredevil had basically engineered a circumstance to make him forget. And the fact that Daredevil had taunted him. But in the end, the response here is no, there's no way that's that's the case. I mean, like we knew, and even Captain America says that, we knew from the time that Wilson Fisk was elected to office, it was only a matter of time before something like this happened, right? Like, lest we forget, Wilson Fisk is the kingpin of crime, or at least he was the kingpin of crime. He was never a good guy. So I understand what you're saying, Daredevil, and sure, you being a dick probably had something to do with this. But at the end of the day, like, Wilson Fisk was only ever going to do this at some point in time, right? All roads we're going to lead to this. So it's not entirely your fault. Now, of course, this leads to the forces of Wilson Fisk, specifically uh, the authorities showing up at the Baxter building. And the reason why is because the Baxter building, of course, is working on what would be perceived as weapons of mass destruction. It's not really their intention to do that, but they're toying with things like antimatter and so on and so forth. Any one of the devices that they're experimenting with, if used for nefarious purposes, could obliterate the entire city. The funny thing about this is that because of the nature of Reed Richards and because of the fact that the experience he works on, the things that he does, really kind of transcend any immediate benefit to like the city of New York and are really more for the benefit of society as a whole. He basically gets a kind of free pass from the federal government, right? Where he basically gets this kind of system where it's like, work on whatever you want to work on. Just make sure you don't use it against humanity because we know that ultimately it's going to benefit us all. The problem with this is that because of, of what's going on with the Powers Act, that basically the federal government's kind of turning a blind eye to the idea of what it is that, that Reed Richards and all of them are working on. So in effect, they've been and thrown under the bus. Now, initially, where the Fantastic Four, or at least Reed and Susan, are like, okay, this ain't gonna happen, right? And they immediately start taking up arms. They're suddenly met by the arrival of Dr. Octopus, who basically slaps on inhibitor collars, right? Collars that basically neutralize their powers. And it's like, yeah, man, the federal government's left you hanging, guys. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. And so all they really end up doing here is basically sounding the alarm and basically telling Johnny Storm and uh, and Ben Grimm, as well as Valeria and Franklin, that it's a code X7, right? Basically, the Baxter building's being invaded. Now, here's one of the funny things about this, right? It's not the first time we've seen this happen. And I was kind of disappointed with how this transpired, right? If you guys remember during Dark Reign, when Jonathan Hickman first started writing the Fantastic Four, that like Norman Osborn, the Green Goblin, when he was director of S.H.I.E.L.D., invaded the Baxter building to take it over. And Franklin Richards dresses a cowboy pointed a faint gun at him, but because he had reality warping powers, he shot him with a real bullet. Like, it was amazing. It was just, just like, like it was small little moments like that when you saw like Franklin's just reality warping power. But Ben Grimm basically steps in and ends up just kind of snatching him up along with Johnny Storm and they effectively take off. And then that's basically it, right? I mean, they, they get out of there as fast as they can. At that point, it switches over to Luke Cage and Jessica Jones obligatory appearance of the comics. The reason why I say obligatory is because this is one of those instances where Jessica Jones appears so that Marvel can remind us she's still Still exists, right? Like she's still there, guys. Uh, she's she still exists in Marvel Comics. Just so you know, here's some stories that involve her. She is there with Luke Cage, and Luke Cage was supposed to have a tie into this event, but basically they ended up canceling it, and I don't know why, because he has an amazing moment here. But basically, like where he and Jessica Jones are like, I mean, yeah, let's lay low. It's why we don't do costumes, right? Because we don't draw attention to ourselves. I mean, granted, like Luke Cage led the Mighty Avengers at one point, so people know who they are. But it's very easy to lay low when you're wearing just like some kind of a coat and like a black shirt 
shirt and some cargo pants or jeans and just kind of calling it a day, right? Where initially they were content with just kind of staying quiet, keeping to themselves, you know, making sure they didn't draw any attention. There's this great big, huge calamity that happens. And basically Luke Cage ends up, you know, getting involved and stepping in only to be met by the arrival of the Shocker, uh, who's working as part of the Thunderbolts. And where the Thunderbolts would have, would have initially had their hands on this, albeit in a pretty unsavory way, right? I mean, they're, they're pretty reckless and they don't really much care about like preserving human life so long as they quote unquote end the threat that where Shocker ends up throwing one of these collars to Luke Cage and is like, put this on and put this on your wife. Luke Cage is like, huh, not a chance, right? And then like a fight breaks out between the two, right? Now, ultimately, of course, Luke Cage is able to get the upper hand and, and able to subdue the Shocker and the two of them basically end up fleeing. But before they do, he makes this really, really amazing speech, right? He says like, this isn't right. He's like, Wilson Fisk is a gangster and a fool, a big man who's small, who needs to show his power over me, my friends, and you. This is not just about superheroes. It's about a man with his grip on all of us. He makes it sound like if he loosens it, you'll all basically be in trouble. Some villain will show up or something like that. The kind of trouble that shows him that it's actually you who has the power here. He says, look, I'm not Captain America. I'm not Mr. Fantastic. He says, I'm just a New Yorker just like you. And if someone's in trouble, I will do what New Yorkers do. I help. And if Mayor Fisk wants to stop me, that's fine. That's a genius speech because what it does is it forces people to accept the fact that they are contributors to the problem, right? And, it, and it's one of the things about on a, on a societal level that people tend to forget, right? It's very easy to kind of adopt this mentality that like everything bad that happens in the world is because of some invisible specter moving behind the scenes. But like every major problem that happens in the world is because of people, right? There's no invisible force out there they're causing problems. It's people who were doing terrible things. And with Luke Cage pointing his finger at everybody out there and saying that if this continues on, it's because you're allowing it, right? By doing nothing, you're saying you're okay with it. If you weren't okay with it, you would do something about it, right? You can't be apathetic and then say, well, I'm apathetic because there's nothing I can do. No, that's just laziness masquerading as apathy. And so by pointing that finger at them and saying, you're the reason why this is happening, it's forcing at least someone or at least driving somebody to acknowledge the fact that they are the problem. And so following that, what you actually end up doing is switching over to Kingpin when he goes to join Butch. Now, Butch Ferris is an interesting character. This guy was basically a henchman of the owl for quite some time. The owl being a D-list villain at best, right? Like this guy was never, ever, ever, ever big time. But the perception here of Butch as the new Kingpin of crime, and even before he became the Kingpin of crime, working his way up the ranks and basically, you know, knocking heads as well as getting moves and promotions in the right places, especially by Izzy, is that he is the legitimate biological son of Wilson Fisk. That Wilson Fisk supposedly had a favor with his mother, a woman named Mrs. P, and that basically left him as the, the real heir here. And so Wilson Fisk largely seems to follow that and saying that he's doing all of this in order to make life easier for his son. That really seems to be the main motivation behind why Fisk is doing this. I wouldn't say that's simply it, and Fisk is one to play the long game. So if this is the perception he's putting off to, uh, to Butch Ferris, I'd say he may very well be pulling a ruse. And so following that, where, where basically he tells Kingpin, like, get out of here, you're basically met with Mike Murdoch. Now, Mike Murdoch, oh, oh my God. Okay, Marvel had this genius idea. <laughs> at one point in time that Matt Murdock operating on the ground level because he didn't want people to know that he was uh, that he was Daredevil had fabricated this identity called Mike Murdock and it wasn't like he suffered with identity disorder he didn't have like a multiple personality disorder or anything I mean he did kind of have a personality disorder in the more recent run but Mike Murdock was ultimately just a concept that he had created there was one point in time when Daredevil was working with the Inhumans and one of them their name escapes me had the ability to basically bring to life anything they read and in reading about Matt Murdock had basically learned that Matt had created the Mike Murdock persona and accidentally made him tangible. Following that, it's just a series of events where Mike Murdock just kind of became his own person doing his own thing and all that kind of stuff. I mean, this also goes in line with the fact that, um, that the entire history of Matt Murdock had basically been rewritten, which is weird. Honestly, I don't know how long this is going to go on for. I imagine Marvel's was just going to retcon all this away and it's just going to go back to Matt Murdock just being Matt Murdock and that's basically going to be it. But because of the life that he'd created for himself, Mike Murdock and Butch Ferris had basically kind of just grown up as friends who were also involved in the criminal underworld. And so that's why the success of Butch is also the success of Mike. And also because Mike's kind of helped him progress a little bit, right? Mike had masqueraded as Daredevil, different things along 
those lines, but it had been instrumental in Butch coming to power as the new kingpin of crime. And so following that, you switch back over to, to Luke Cage and Jessica Jones. And Jessica Jones, of course, is like, yeah, you know, we, we got to get out of here, you know, all that kind of stuff. But when they get out there, they're met by Tony Stark. And so Tony Stark's like, yeah, guys, we got to do something about this. Okay, cool, whatever, Tony. Like, <laughs> I mean, he wants to get rid of him, right? Because a lot of it's Jessica Jones making this case about how Kingpin is, is basically overthrowing democracy or at least seems to be making himself totalitarian. She doesn't really know how Tony Stark feels about that because the last time there was a major catastrophe like this, right, Civil War, Tony Stark sided against the superhero community and in favor of registration. But in the end, Stark's like, no, it's, it's different this time. One, because I've arbitrarily decided it. And two, because it's not exactly like it was with Civil War. With Civil War, there was a tangible reason why the Superhuman Registration Act was being passed, right? The Nitro had detonated in Stanford, Connecticut. He'd killed men, women, and children. And so with all that death and destruction, that catalytic event, people were like, we're done, right? Like, that's it, right? That catalyst had, had like set things off. They're like, we're finished, right? We're done with collateral damage and all that kind of stuff. The superhero community needs to be held accountable for the things they say and do, right? Superhuman registration is the way to go. Wilson Fisk is using existing scenarios to paint this kind of dark and sinister series of events in some unguaranteed future that may or may not come to pass if superheroes are not held accountable. I guess maybe Civil War kind of did the same thing, but nonetheless, you see what I'm saying, right? He's using circumstances as a reason to justify the launch of an event that, in all honesty, couldn't even have been stopped by the superhero community. An eldritch demon, a primordial being from the void that existed before the universe, finally gets free and attacks Earth, right? I mean, there's nothing superheroes could have done to prevent that. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so using these almost unpreventable circumstances as a reason to explain why it is that these kind of restrictive policies need to be implemented, that's the difference between Civil War and this. We're kind of nitpicking a bit, to be honest, but you know, we got to create a difference somehow. So we're not just saying it's Civil War, like Civil War 3, just on a smaller scale. But the other thing about this is we actually end up finding out that basically Dr. Octopus is working on something for Wilson Fisk. And it seems to be some kind of portal that accesses, you know, another dimension. We don't know exactly what it's for or what it does, but it looks to be the bridge that Reed Richards had constructed during Jonathan Hickman's run. The same bridge technology they used when it came to like the incursions from Avengers and New Avengers and all that kind of stuff. But Wilson Fisk ultimately, you know, cuts Dr. Octopus off and says like, the package is here. And that's when you find out Wilson Fisk has actually freed the purple man Zebediah Kilgrave from prison. And it's kind of a cool thing here because what he does is like, he goes through this folder that Kilgrave has and he's like, do you know what this folder is? And where Kilgrave's like, I don't know, right? Because he always thinks small. He's like, this, this, this folder is power, right? Because it represents knowledge. It represents information that I can use. Because in a lot of ways, Wilson Fisk in Marvel Comics is very much a J. Edgar Hoover kind of guy, right? For those of you guys who don't know who that is, J. Edgar Hoover was the head of the FBI at one point in time. And he had information on everyone. Some say he was the most powerful man in the world, right? Because they had information on everyone, right? Foreign dignitaries, citizens, government officials, that if J. Edgar Hoover Hoover wanted it, J. Edgar Hoover got it. And in fact, after J. Edgar Hoover left the FBI, there were sweeping changes to the power of the FBI director because of the threat that J. Edgar Hoover represented. That people who were talking, if you go back and you read any of like those old interviews and those old books or anything like that, people were like, that guy could have become a dictator. The only reason he didn't is because he chose not to. I mean, this guy could do virtually anything he wanted to in law enforcement. Kingpin is very much the same way. He really operates a lot like J. Edgar Hoover as well, kind of operating behind the scenes using the knowledge he has to force people to, you know, create policies or to avoid laws or make laws that are beneficial to him. The problem with this is that as he's talking to Kilgrave, he's like, this folder has nothing to use against you, right? There's nothing here. Your children hate you. They want to have you dead. So I can't use that against you. You have no loved ones. You have nothing. There's nothing that I can use against you here. But in a lot of ways, that's always what Kilgrave wanted. Kilgrave always wanted to have this kind of scenario where, where he could never really have anything used against him because he never had anything at all. But at the end of the day, when he goes to basically use his powers on Wilson Fisk, it doesn't work. And the reason why is because Wilson Fisk is one of those very, very few number of individuals that exist out there where his willpower is so 
strong that Zebediah Kilgrave's powers cannot work on him. That's one of the things to know. Kilgrave does not use mind control in the traditional sense. It's not telepathy. He emits pheromones. But a person with a substantial level or a high enough level of fortitude, right? The ability to withstand the effects of Kilgrave, they can overcome him. His powers will have no effect on them whatsoever. And so ultimately, Wilson Fisk seizes Zebediah Kilgrave and then it's just like done, right? He's like, what a squandered gift. He says, perhaps it's time someone more worthy possessed it. And so ultimately, it looks like he kills Zebediah Kilgrave seemingly for the purpose of attaining his power and using him for himself. The other thing that we end up finding out is that Wilson Fisk has a sight set much, much higher than mayor of New York. What he's shooting for is to become president of the United States. And it looks like he will do it in the same way most politicians will do it, which is by any means necessary. Beg, borrow, steal, or kill. But what this does is this initially picks up basically with Danny Rand, right? If you guys recall the last video that we did, that basically the entirety of New York superhero community has for the most part begun to go underground, right? That the Kingpin essentially had legislation passed that basically outlawed superheroes in the city of New York. And it's creating a more, I guess a smaller version of the original Civil War event. But what this has led to is Kingpin enlisting villains to basically play out the roles of people who would essentially enforce superheroes being rounded up and basically being arrested for vigilante activity, right? So it's kind of ironic that Kingpin would use what are in effect people with powers to basically round up people with powers. But it's not that dissimilar from what Tony Stark did during Civil War. The Tony Stark had the Thunderbolts and then he also had the Mighty Avengers, right? They basically went around and rounded up people who were violating superhuman registration. And so what you have here is of course, Danny Rand basically talking directly with uh, with Luke Cage. The two of them kind of having a conversation. Luke Cage telling him, look man, like, you know, we're basically gonna go get with Steve Rogers and we're all essentially going to go underground. Avengers work out when we're better together. Like everybody's just kind of keeping everything safe. And Danny Rand's response is that he'll basically just be fine, right? He's like, I might just drive north and lay low just in case. I mean, he's got the money and the resources to do it. That while Wilson Fisk is implementing this anti-superhero legislation, basically, his authority is not on the same level as Tony Stark's was during the events of Civil War. Tony Stark could have frozen people's assets if he chose to, right? That's the kind of leeway and the sort of authority he had that was given to him both as director of shield and essentially as a government liaison right the person who was basically implementing all this and making it happen fisk doesn't have that kind of authority here and so it really give danny rand as a ultra rich guy the ability to just kind of take off but before he can he's basically met by the arrival of crossbones now the fight between crossbones and danny rand this is kind of a cool thing crossbones is one of those little unsung guys in, in marvel comics right he just doesn't quite get enough respect and that was compounded by the events of of the marvel cinema universe but crossbones is pretty legit right this guy was trained by taskmaster he's very very capable now danny rand of course is a master martial artist so he's able or at least seemingly able to get his upper hand on on crossbones and we don't really see how it all concludes all we really get here is that with everything popping off because danny rand is like 30 blocks away there's no real way for them to get there that tony stark and luke cage and and jessica jones can't really access a quinjet that tony stark's armor's locked down as soon soon as the forces of Wilson Fisk tried to enter into his home. So they don't really have access to anything that could get them to Danny Rand. I mean, they could try, right? But to travel 30 blocks in New York, anyone who's been to that city will tell you it's gonna take more than a car, <laughs> right? You're literally gonna have to fly there. And so as a result of that, they're like, okay, if we're going to help this city and we're going to fix this, we can't deviate and try to go get Danny Rand. We basically gotta leave him, right? The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. The guy's a master martial artist. I'm sure he'll be okay. And so at that point, you switch over to Wilson Fisk when he's confronted by the new Daredevil, Elektra. Now, here's the thing, and I'm a little, I'm a little ashamed to say this. I have not been reading Daredevil. I have no idea what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why Elektra is Daredevil right now. I mean, I have a general idea, right? Just from what people have been tweeting and talking about, but I don't really, I don't know the ins and outs of this. So I am ashamed to say that as a comic book YouTuber, <laughs> I am being negligent in my duties. Here's my question for you guys. Should I be reading Daredevil right now? Right? Like is Daredevil comic, uh, a comic that I should be reading at the moment? Cause I'm not gonna lie. I think the idea of Elektra basically replacing Daredevil is kind of cool. And I'd be interested in seeing how that whole thing's unfolds. So, those of you guys who are reading Daredevil, should I be reading it? <laughs> is it a resounding yes? Is it, a, is it an absolute no? Do not read it. It's awful. Let me know what you guys think. The important thing here though, and we don't really know the ins and outs 
else of what's going on here. The important thing is that given the history of Electra as basically being an assassin, that when she shows up here at the office at the office of Kingpin, right off the bat, he was like, okay. So I was kind of expecting this somewhere along the line, right? Like, I know you're the new Daredevil. I know your history. I know what you're about. I know that most likely somewhere along the line, you would come here to try to kill me. Here's the thing that's not going to happen, right? Like, I get that this whole thing with you guys, right? That you guys are superheroes and all that kind of stuff, but do you really believe that because you have these freakish lives that resulted in you getting freakish powers, that you can just somehow do whatever it is that you wanna do? Not a chance, right? And as soon as she pulls a weapon on him, that's when he realizes, yeah, like you're, you're here to kill me. He's like, but here's the thing, you've neutered yourself, right? Like you're playing the long game with the real Daredevil. You don't kill like you used to, so why are you here, right? If you have come here with the intention of somehow intimidating me and getting me to stand down because I'm so terrified of the dreaded Electra Nachos, who's one of the deadliest assassins in the world, then let me help you understand your, your, your place in the bigger picture, right? He's like, there is someone who came here before you did, and they want to meet you, right? They want to fight you, and they want you to meet them at a particular location. Go, go do your thing, right? There's nothing for you here. You're not going to kill me, and in a hand-to-hand -hand fight, I would tear you apart. So nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to come of this, right? Go and face off against that guy who wanted to fight you, because here, there's really nothing going on. Now, the reality, and, and really the reason why she leaves in the first place, is seemingly because of the fact that Kingpin basically seems to know what she did, how she betrayed Matt Murdock, and that if Matt finds out, she'll lose everything. Again, I don't know the ins and outs of what's going on here. I feel like I should be reading Daredevil, right? I really, really feel like I should be reading this. So I'm going to do that, right? I'm going to go on Comixology and I'm going to read Daredevil. So having said that, we switch over to Avengers Mansion, right? Now here's the thing. Avengers Mansion hasn't been used for a long, long time, right? In Marvel Comics, they haven't used it for quite some time. And in fact, the Avengers Mansion itself has really turned into a place of tourism, right? Where people go and they visit said, wow, this is where the Avengers used to hang out and all that kind of stuff. So it's a very, very attractive thing as far as building up money for the city of New York. But the sub-basement of Avengers Mansion, that thing is still in operation. That it operates secretly and is really more of a bunker. That's one of the things that I kind of like about what Chip Zdarsky is doing here. It's very Nick Fury, right? For those of you guys who don't know anything about Nick Fury, and I mean like old school Nick Fury, right? The white guy Nick Fury, not Samuel Jackson. That guy had bunkers everywhere. He was the most paranoid guy ever, right? And it kind of makes sense, right? When you're like the man on the wall and you've got access to all this information and you know more about what's going on in the world than seemingly anybody else in the world, uh, you start to realize just how fast things could go sideways. So Nick Fury had bunkers on top of bunkers on top of bunkers. He had hideouts all over the place, right? But one of the things here is that having this place in, in the basement, in the sub-basement of the Avengers Mansion, it's a place that hasn't been accessed for quite some time. Now, one of the other things that goes on here, and this is a really, really cool concept, and it's one of the reasons why so many people were pissed off that the Luke Cage tie-in for Devil's Reign was canceled is that Tony Stark ends up realizing there's a handful of kids who are sitting outside the building and they basically record that Tony Stark's here. Of course, no one's supposed to know that they're going to the sub-basement of Avengers Mansion. So Tony Stark initially tries to bribe them and then Luke Cage steps in and says, look guys, like with everything going on here right now, even you have to realize that superheroes being outlawed in the city of New York, that's a bad thing, right? That villains are basically the law enforcement now. Do you really trust that they're somehow going to turn over a new leaf and do good things? And so he's like, look, like the city is in serious danger. You guys are in serious danger. Do me a solid. Right now, here's the big difference. This is why Luke Cage was always a great character. Here's the big difference between Luke Cage, Danny Rand, even Spider-Man, and people like Tony Stark and Captain America and so on and so forth. Tony Stark, Captain America, the Avengers, they're big names, right? When people think about the Avengers, they think about well, like the, the Earth's mightiest heroes, right? Like the people who save us from all kinds of threats. But when they think of Luke Cage, they think of one of us. And that's the difference. That's the huge difference. The Captain America, Iron Man, Thor, those guys, they sit up there in the tower. And people don't say that from a place of, of like vindictiveness, right? They don't say that from a place of cynicism. Like they're up there in their tower and they don't care about us. I mean, of course they do. They save the world. But there's a big difference between looking at a superhero who saves the world and looking at a superhero who essentially looks out for you. Luke Cage has never worn a mask. Luke Cage was part of Heroes for Hire. He originally launched it, right? Like ground level superheroes helping out people on the ground level, always looking out for his own in his neighborhood.
neighborhood. That word spreads. And so people look at Luke Cage and they're like, he's one of us, right? He looks out for us as the little guy. He knows our names. He shops at our stores. He buys food from our restaurants. That's how people see him. And so that's why when Luke Cage comes along and is like, do me a solid guys, right? Like delete the video. No one needs to know we're here. They're like, yeah, man, of course. Like we'll definitely help you out Luke Cage, right? It's a matter of perception. Now from there, you switch over to Spider-Man. And here's one thing that I do want to specify. This whole thing that's going on right now, this is actually Ben Riley. And the reason why this whole thing is going on to kind of sidetrack from Devil's Reign for a second, this deals with something called the Beyond Corporation. Now, contrary to what you may believe, while the Beyond Corporation was established back in 2006 in the Next Wave comics, as far as we're aware, they don't have any direct ties to the Beyonders, which is a little strange because the Beyond Corporation basically consists of people who exist beyond the multiverse, right? Like they literally go into universes and just cause problems for people. It's, it's really all they do. And they do it because it's fun. The way this had played out is that Peter Parker is essentially in a coma. That during the events of Spider-Man 76, I think, that Peter Parker had basically been exposed to like a huge amount of radiation, which had basically taken him out of commission. Now, during that time, the Beyond Corporation had basically gotten involved in essentially appointing Ben Riley as the officially recognized Spider-Man. And they did this because they essentially bought the copyrights to Spider-Man operating on a private level, which I didn't even know that was something you could do. <laughs> and in fact, that's what happens in the comics. Ben Riley's like, I didn't even know that could be done. <laughs> but the Beyond Corporation did, right? And because Peter Parker is basically a broke guy, how's he gonna fight a massive corporation with seemingly endless resources? And so with Peter out of commission, Ben Riley has been appointed to be the new Spider-Man, and that's why he is here. So it's kind of a cool thing, because as this goes on, you start to realize that, of course, he's basically stepping in on behalf of, like, Robbie Robertson and those guys, because what you have here is Taskmaster and Whiplash. Now, Whiplash, cool, whatever, who cares? Taskmaster is the guy. Taskmaster's the dude. I love Tony Masters, right? Like, you guys, anybody who's been around this channel long enough knows I love Tony Masters, right? I love him almost as much as I love Captain Carrot. Captain Carrot, I love Captain Carrot. Captain Carrot's a super bunny. I love him, right? Like, I, I love, well, I mean, not in love, but like, I love the character. <laughs> I love the character of Taskmaster because he's just, he's so underappreciated. But when he shows up, things are cool and is interesting as it was seeing the Taskmaster in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I really wish it had been Tony Masters. I love the character of Tony Masters, but it was still cool to see that version of the Taskmaster. I digged it either way. But regardless, of course, Ben Riley steps in. Now, here's the thing to understand. Ben Riley is not an incapable Spider-Man, and Ben Riley knows enough to know what Taskmaster is capable of. The big difference here is that Peter Parker would have handled this differently than Ben Riley did, right? Ben Riley knows who Taskmaster is, he knows what Taskmaster is about. And the funny thing about this is the way he's written here, if you didn't know it was Ben Riley, you would think it was Peter Parker. Now, a lot of that's because Ben is a clone of Peter, right, from the old Clone Saga story. So it makes sense their mannerisms would be very, 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 very similar. But the important thing here is that you basically have a fight that breaks out between the two of them. Now, the fight's really, really cool, right? Because immediately Taskmaster starts to get the upper hand on Ben Riley, which is exactly what you would expect, right? Fighting Taskmaster is fighting Captain America or Deadpool or even Peter Parker or somebody like the Incredible Hulk minus the strength or Captain America with his martial arts or Batroc the Leaper, right? Like when you fight Taskmaster, you're fighting a legion of different superheroes because he masters and he knows all of their fighting styles. It's what made him so cool. It's one of the things I love so much about him, right? It is a sight to behold, especially the fights between Taskmaster and Captain America. Those fights are the stuff of legend, man. I don't know how many of you guys, anybody out there who's watching this video right now, if you've read the fights between Taskmaster and Captain America, you know what I'm talking about. The fights are amazing, especially when like Captain America's analyzing Taskmaster as they fight and he's like calling out who it is that Taskmaster's mimicking as they fight. It's so cool. I know Tata Hussey Coates did that recently. It was amazing. But here's, here's the thing, right? Right off the bat, because Ben Riley realizes that he cannot get the upper hand on Taskmaster as he's facing off against him and Whiplash, because Whiplash is basically holding people hostage, that at any point in time, Whiplash could kill those guys because of the electric tentacles he has. He's got more than enough electricity to take those guys out. So that's why he's like, one, I've got to get my mind off the idea that hostages are in danger. And then two, we're fighting in a confined space, which is true. Spider-Man fights better when he's in an open space. He can do fine in a confined space, but when he's got some room to move, when he can use his webbing to kind of get around, right? When he can get distance,
distance between himself and Taskmaster, then it makes things a lot easier. And so what he actually does is he goads Whiplash, largely because Whiplash is an idiot, but he basically goads him, right? He's like, hey man, so I know you consider yourself an A-list villain, but I gotta ask, man, how does it feel to be like a B or a C-list villain where you're basically following orders and guarding hostages? And of course that goads Whiplash long enough for him to be able to get the upper hand on Whiplash and essentially take him out. And so with that being the case, the fight then turns to Taskmaster. The crazy thing about this is that like Ben Riley just can't handle him because the impact of fighting Whiplash, despite his modified Spider-Man suit, is enough that it temporarily weakens him, which allows Taskmaster to slap the inhibitor collar around his neck and then basically throw him out of the building. Now, of course, he knows Ben Riley will survive. The guy crashes into a car. And then from there, he's basically taken by Taskmaster and, and essentially arrested, right? And so from there, what you end up doing is switching over to the Fantastic Four. Remember, Reed Richards, Susan Storm, they were taken by the forces of Kingpin. That's a thing Ben Grimm and Johnny Storm and then Franklin and Valeria had basically been whisked away, which by the way, I wanna answer a question that a lot of people were asking in the last video, which is why doesn't Franklin do something about this, right? Keep in mind that one, Franklin's not on the same level that he used to be. And two, it's a MacGuffin kind of thing, right? The yes, Franklin can alter reality, stuff like that. He can do all kinds of crazy stuff. He's a, a powerhouse in the universe, but you can't have every problem solved by Franklin, right? Because then that just becomes the status quo, right? Franklin uses his reality warping abilities and everybody forgets the superheroes are outlawed, including Wilson Fisk and the day saved, right? Like literally every story would end with Franklin Richards waving his hand. So that's why you don't really see him invoked all that often. It's also one of the reasons why Marvel keeps him relatively young, because with Jonathan Hickman writing adult Franklin Richards the way he did, especially during the Fantastic Four run and the Avengers New Avengers run, that with that level of power, Franklin could seemingly do anything, right? You combine that with the History of the Marvel Universe comic that Marvel wrote, which is interesting that Franklin merges with Galactus at the end of all reality and is born anew, the two of them kind of being a composite being that's more powerful than the sum of their parts. And so it's one of those things where Franklin just doesn't get used that much because the nature of his powers is such you would expect him to simply just end everything. And so what's kind of funny here with regards to, to Susan and Reed is there's not a whole lot doing. There's basically just a fight that breaks out inside the uh, inside the prison, but it seems like it's supposed to operate as a distraction. So the two of them can actually end up engineering their own escape, presumably helping others escape as well. But we'll kind of have to read, you know, read further on to find out what's going on with that. But the cool thing here is what you end up doing is you switch over to, uh, to Dr. Octopus, who is basically working working alongside Wilson Fisk. And the idea here is that Dr. Octopus's mind and the technology he's able to utilize would basically set things up so that Wilson Fisk could dominate the Purple Man and then seemingly steal his powers and then use that for the purpose of basically controlling New York. That with Kingpin, while he was elected mayor, if you guys recall the last video that we talked about, he was elected mayor because of the fact that he had instilled trust in people, that that's not something you can rely on, right? People are incredibly finicky. They will support you in one month and then hate you the next, right? Because the average American just doesn't know what they want, right? Like their wants just sort of change. There's no consistency when it comes to American people. And so Wilson Fisk in realizing that wants to solidify his ability to remain mayor by basically using the powers of the Purple Man. And that while he won't necessarily be able to control people, he will be able to influence them, right? Push them to the polls, get them to vote for Wilson Fisk, different things like that, and basically maintain power. And as long as no one knows that he's using the abilities of the Purple Man to do it, no one will be any the wiser. Now, the funny thing about this is that Otto Octavius is no idiot. You guys know that, right? Otto Octavius is no fool. And he knew right off the bat, once he realized the plan of Wilson Fisk was to utilize Purple Man, that Wilson Fisk would try to use those powers on him. And so what he did is he created neuroblockers that would actually block the powers of the Purple Man from being able to influence him. So literally, like, like Kingpin tries to use those powers on him and he's like, no, you're good, man. Uh, the, the influence of Purple Man doesn't work on me, right? Those pheromones don't affect me. I've got neuroblockers, but I'll leave you to do your thing. And basically, leaves, right? Of course, you also end up finding out that Elektra is there to essentially face off against Kraven the Hunter, which looks like it would be a really, really cool fight. But once you get to the sub-basement of Avengers Mansion with Tony Stark in them, that remember, Tony Stark's goal here, right? The plan, quote unquote, for defeating Wilson Fisk is for Tony to actually run against him. And what happens is that once they get into the facility, like Luke Cage is like, Tony, we got to talk about your plan, dude. Like you running against Wilson Fisk, that's not going to work. That's not going to happen because it's basically rich guy versus rich guy, right? Like it's 
too much of a toss up. Could you win? Possibly, right? You're very, very famous. People know you, right? But at the end of the day, we need someone that people are more likely to identify with, right? People want one of their own. Now, in all honesty, there is a reason why we don't just walk down the street and ask any swinging dick if they want to run for president of the United States, right? Like we've had an answer to that question. We obviously don't want to have to go through that again. But Luke Cage kind of approaches this from the perspective of like, I think I should be the one to run. So while the mayor is not on the same level as the president, the fact remains putting an average Joe in such a position of power could potentially be disastrous. That despite Luke Cage's best intentions, he doesn't know what it means to run an entire city and everything that goes on there. I mean, here in the real world, you just got to deal with New York as it exists now, right? In the comics, you got to deal with New York as, as it exists now, plus superheroes and supervillains. <laughs> <laughs> you got to deal with all that stuff. And so at the end of the day, he was like, look, like this is about beating Wilson Fisk. It's not about your ego. It's not about you wanting to be mayor or anything like that. Like it's about the fact that Wilson needs to go down. And honestly, you are not in the best position to do this, right? Like you are Tony Stark. The superhero community is still a little distrustful of you because a lot of the things that have happened, your history is sketchy. There are things about your own personal life that the general public knows they would not necessarily be a, fa be a fan of, right? You're not the best person for this. And so what ends up happening is that Luke says, like, are you on board with this? And the response of Iron Man is, yeah, sure. But obviously there's some disdain there, right? Obviously Iron Man is not a big fan of what's going on. Now, how far that goes, we don't entirely know, right? We're not really sure exactly how that's going to happen. What we do know is switching over to Dr. Octopus, what you end up getting here is him basically having this kind of, of internal monologue where he says, Wilson Fisk is a small man thinking small. Let him hold his small amount of power. As always, Otto Octavius understands true power. True power is the laboratory of the mad scientist Reed Richards with his wild inventions like an interdimensional gate. So let Fisk control a city. My plans as ever are superior. And what we end up finding out is that Dr. Octopus has opened this dimensional gate and then seemingly brought in Wolverine, Ghost Rider, and the Incredible Hulk from an alternate universe. What he plans on doing with these guys? I have no clue, but I am Reed ridiculously excited to find out. Like, I am so excited to find out. So what this does here is, is this one initially picks up with Ben Riley. Now remember, Ben Riley is the current Spider-Man. Peter Parker is currently out of commission. So Ben Riley basically took over his place. And of course the police are being none too kind to Ben Riley. I mean, obviously this is police brutality, but it's only really police brutality if somebody's willing to do something about it. Otherwise, it's just cops being dicks is really all it is. And so Ben Riley, the funny thing about this is like, he doesn't really care, right? Like the cops are just, are literally just like beating him up. I mean, he's, he's all bruised and smashed. Like they smash his face into a table and they're like, what's your name? And he was like, uh, he's like Johnny Spider. Johnny Spider's my name, <laughs> that kind of a thing. But like, he's just not taking the cops seriously, which is the one thing, as I understand it, really pisses off cops, right? And one of the funny things that kind of happens, what we're told here is when it comes to this idea of like civil wars and different things along those lines, one of the big misconceptions is that a civil war would ultimately boil down between those in authority versus like the citizens. But that's not true because people's loyalties are not necessarily tied to the jobs they work. And that's what you're seeing here. That yes, there are a lot of people here who are police officers. Pretty much everybody in the precinct is a police officer, but they don't all agree with Wilson Fisk. And so one of the things that's kind of established is that they're not going to process Ben Riley Spider-Man. Like they just refuse to process him because they believe that what Wilson Fisk is doing is wrong. When Ben Grimm and Johnny Storm show up here, Ben Grimm is one of these interesting concepts because despite being a member of the Fantastic for Ben Grimm always kind of had this role where he was as much street level as he was the grander superhero community, right? Like the guy on Yancey Street and that kind of a thing, right? He grew up as like one of these New Yorkers, right? He's one of them. And you would always see him just as inclined to, to basically stand up for like the small guy on the street as you would standing alongside the Fantastic Four and like facing off against Galactus or something along those lines. And so that's why when he shows up here and he's like, look, I know, uh, you know, a lot of you guys out there don't agree with what Wilson Fisk is doing, right? You guys don't agree agree with, with what's happening here. You're not a big fan of it. And I can appreciate that, right? Because you know, we're heroes, you know, we're trying to do the right thing. And you see through what it is that Wilson Fisk is doing, even if these other police officers here are unable to or unwilling to, but here's the rub. We're going to get our friend because he saved our lives multiple times and he saved your life as well. So we're going to get our friend and we're going to leave. Now, Johnny Storm, of course, basically just like melts the door and then Ben Grimm walks through a wall. And then you of course have this cop and this, this chick that's with him, you know, that have their guns drawn. I mean, what are they going to do? Right? I mean, with Johnny 
storm just as hot as he is if they fire off bullets they would probably end up melting them before they got to him and then with ben Grimm, the guy's basically bulletproof so like i mean these cops can't really do anything so they literally just pick up ben riley and just leave right because what are these cops gonna do and so at that point you switch over to luke cage now again i still say one of the biggest problems that i have with devil's reign right now is they skipped the luke cage tie-in i would love to have seen what the luke cage tie-in was about because what you're getting here is basically the follow-up to the last video that we did on the main devil's reign event which is luke cage running for mayor because it's one of these things where in a lot of ways their hands are tied i mean could they kidnap Wilson Fisk and then just like fly him into the sun and like that's the end of Wilson Fisk right he just disappears and nobody knows where he went sure but if they killed him they'd make him a martyr and what that would do is it would basically verify his cause the best way to defeat Wilson Fisk is to get the people on your side right the best way to do that is not to like force the citizenry into following your orders it's to give them a reason to basically ignore anybody who demonizes your dictatorship but basically giving people a reason to rally under you as opposed to opposing you and so Luke Cage plays this game pretty well insofar as saying like you guys know who Wilson Fisk is right I mean yes like you guys elected him as mayor because he made a bunch of grand promises and he saved you guys during the whole Secret Empire event and all that kind of stuff but behind all of that you know who Wilson Fisk is you know he's the kingpin of crime you know he's got his hands in virtually everything and you know this law is unjust you know this law is a problem so I as Luke Cage am running basically against Wilson Fisk as mayor now what this does is it puts Luke Cage in a fantastic fantastic position because it basically makes him untouchable the reason why is because if for example luke cage were to be found beaten up or assaulted then at that point it's a it's a felony right you literally have a politician that is basically trying to force another politician out of the picture using physical violence that would land wilson fisk in prison for the rest of his life and so luke cage basically cannot be touched right it's one of those things where it's like the guy's running for mayor the difficult thing here is getting people to agree with him and that's what makes devil's reign so interesting is because what you end up doing is you basically switch over to uh, to a conversation between Susan Storm and her lawyer. And the cool thing about this is that the, the conversation between the two is such that there are legitimate concerns that when it comes to the overall country in terms of what's going on in the city of New York, they see it as a New York problem, right? This is New York's issue. New York is the one that's dealing with like superheroes causing all kinds of problems and supervillains and the fights between the two and collateral damage and all that kind of stuff, right? This is a New York issue. The concern here is that that if these heroes are not rounded up by the city of New York, right, if they are not basically in prison, if this kind of insurgency, if you want to call it that, is allowed to continue, suddenly it'll turn into other people's problems because these people in New York will retreat to other cities and other states. They'll go to New Jersey or they'll go to Washington, D.C. or they'll go down to Virginia in the Potomac or something along those lines, right? But they'll basically start bringing their problems to other people's doorstep. And so the biggest concern here is that if this is not contained in the city of New York, York, it could lead to federal law, the return of the Superhuman Registration Act. And of course, no one wants that. <laughs> because even then, with the Superhuman Registration Act, as it was initially done, Tony Stark was able to curtail the most extreme versions of the Superhuman Registration Act. But in this instance, because of what's going on, because of how dangerous more recent events have been, that the result would be the Superhuman Registration Act wouldn't really be able to be curtailed by someone like Tony Stark. And ultimately, it would be the worst possible scenario for the superhero community. Community. And so because of that, the whole thing is we have to basically find a way to keep this contained. Luke Cage is running for mayor, and in all honesty, he stands the best possible chance of being able to end all of this. Following that, you switch over to Zebediah Kilgrave. Now remember, one of the things that had happened here is that the, the psychic prism essentially allows Wilson Fisk to harness the powers of Zebediah Kilgrave and to use them. And that's one of the things that seems to be going on here. More so than that, what's funny is there's a conversation that goes on between the two, where Wilson Fisk kind of talks about how he's doing this to become mayor and all that kind of stuff and Kilgrave having been around the block more than a few times is like no you're full of crap Wilson Fisk like this is not about you becoming mayor or anything along those lines this is all based on a petty grudge Daredevil did something to you to make you forget who he was and you want to hurt him back that's all this is right that's, that's literally all this is you're targeting him and everyone he cares about and you're going through the legal system to do it because it's a way that they simply can't punch they can't beat up the legal system they can't assault the legal 
system or the political system is the one thing they can't destroy because basically you're taking the system that they support and using it against them and the funny thing here is when wilson fisk is like how could you possibly know this the response of Kilgrave is because i feel it too it's like a fog in your brain i knew the identity of daredevil and now i can't remember something happened and where the initial thought of kingpin is wait are you the one who did this to me the response of Kilgrave is no 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 but somebody used my powers to do it it's a more diluted form of my powers but it's my powers nonetheless it's my kids somebody used the purple children to do this to you and me to make us forget the identity of daredevil and so following that where kingpin basically goes on a mission to capture the purple children the kids of the purple man you actually switch over to what what's really left of the avengers you got iron man you got she hulk captain america daredevil and so on and they're all kind of having this conversation over what it is that they're going to do with everything that's going on here right like i mean do they find some way to take out wilson fisk that's one of the discussions that's on the table the other problem here is that for luke cage the polls are not looking very good that what it looks like is that wilson fisk has successfully managed to basically compartmentalize and control fear in such a way to where the citizens of new york are actually afraid of what life would be like if they went back to the way things were before superheroes doing the best they can facing off against supervillains but in all in all operating with impunity but in the middle of all this suddenly jessica jones chimes in and is like like when all the heroes are arguing and debating with each other she's like something something's not right right something feels wrong here something's off she's like wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute no this is the purple man this is the power of the purple man and when the question's asked like no no no, no like you know how do you how do you know that i mean one when jessica jones comes along and says the purple man's involved you don't really argue right i mean her history is directly intertwined with zebediah kilgrave no one knows kilgrave better than jessica jones does but she also understands the nature of his powers and how it feels to be influenced by his powers and she's like it's subtle i can feel it but it's subtle the whole city hasn't descended into madness but fisk is somehow or another using the powers of the purple man to influence people not control them right it'd be different if he was like i'm gonna use my powers and everyone's gonna go to the polls and vote for me versus using powers to influence fear it's subtle and it's small and it's a genius stroke and that's when daredevil steps in and says yes like this has to be wilson fisk captain america is a little uncertain right steve rogers is like i mean okay look we can go in and try to take out wilson fisk but here's the problem if we're wrong right if we are wrong here the whole thing will blow up in our face we'll be the bad guys right we'll be vilified any support that we have in the public will be gone and at the end of the day what we're doing requires public support our ability to function as superheroes lives and dies based on whether or not the general public supports us if we attack the mayor of new york who is out there right now telling the public that we are dangerous and it turns out that we're wrong that he has nothing to do with purple man and none of this is the case it's game over that's the end of it but the 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 idea of daredevil remaining steadfast is no it is wilson fisk and notice this one of the things that kind of goes on here is like we got to take him out right like we have to we have to basically take this guy out we're going to remove him from office and when the question is asked like are we really entertaining the idea of killing wilson fisk or like disappearing him or something like that the response of daredevil is that's how it is when you're an anti-hero right we do the things that superheroes just can't bring themselves to do captain america's great and everything but you can't rely on captain america for this right his moral compass is too strong or whatever the case is it's our job as anti-heroes what we have here is a clear and present danger in the form of wilson fisk the mayor of new york the only way to fix this is to get rid of him now the funny thing about this is that they're not the only ones that have tried to launch an attack on wilson fisk there is a winter soldier tie-in to devil's reign which is weird to see them just arbitrarily pulling bucky barnes out of nowhere right and then just like launching a one shot with him i haven't had a chance to read it yet i want to uh i have no idea if it's good or not that's one of the things about about winter soldier man sometimes the comics are great and other times they're terrible it really depends <laughs> there is no medium there but i do want to check it out but regardless because of what had gone on with the Winter Soldier and all that kind of stuff, the fact that City Hall, the penthouse of Wilson Fisk, right, the mansion, had all basically become compromised, there's heightened levels of security here. The problem is that while they're basically contemplating how they're going to take out Wilson Fisk, suddenly the forces of Otto Octavius come flowing out, right? Like the Otto Incredible Hulk and Wolverine and like Ghost Rider and those guys all come flying out here. Now where the Otto Ghost Rider goes and attacks the Avengers, he takes out Iron Man. And the statement of Iron Man is particularly confusing 
confusing here because he says, no, stay away. I did what you asked. What it looks like is Iron Man sold him out. That Iron Man told, like literally told Kingpin and all them, the Avengers are coming for you, right? Like they're coming right now and they're gonna, they're gonna try to take you out, right? They're gonna try to remove, like forcefully remove you from office and that's gonna be it. At that point, like literally all these guys, you know, they're, they're, they're standing, like they're facing off as best they can. They're holding their ground. But then once Captain America gets over to Iron Man, he realizes it's not Iron Man, it's Chameleon, right? The master of disguise. What a genius writing stroke, right? Chameleon was masquerading as Iron Man and then basically set a trap. Once Captain America realizes what's going on, he was like, Avengers, fall back and like, get out of here, right? We have to go because we're gonna die here. Like if we stay here, they will kill us because what this is by all standards of measurement is an assassination attempt of a political official. That's how it's going to look. That's how it's going to be depicted. The Avengers tried to forcefully remove and or assassinate a political official. And so they're just like, like, we can't be here. Like we can't stay here. Now, of course, it's one of those things where Daredevil's like, no, we can't let him get away. But in the end, it's just like, no, we have to go. And so what you end up doing is switching over to, to Foggy Nelson, right? He's the attorney for Luke Cage, the one that's basically representing Luke Cage as far as his desire to become mayor and so on and so forth. Once he gets to the office, he makes a kind of offhand remark of like, yeah, man, I, God, I really should have gone home. And there's, there's a couple people in the office that are like, yeah, you really should have. Here's a problem. You and that lady lawyer you have, you're loud. And our boss doesn't like loud people. So our boss has decided you're better off not being able to speak. In effect, the kingpin has seemingly sent henchmen to the lawyer of Luke Cage to Foggy Nelson's office to basically pummel him, to silence him, right? It's political sabotage. This is getting messy, but oh my God, do I love this. Now, picking up from the end of last week's video, right? The last issue, this basically takes place two weeks after the attempt of what you could kind of call the secret Avengers, I guess. They don't officially have a name. They're just calling themselves the Avengers, but basically their attempt on Wilson Fisk, if anything, to take the life of Wilson Fisk, right? To take him down. Of course, they proved to be unsuccessful, but what this did is it basically emboldened with uh, Wilson Fisk, right? In the sense that now they've got drones out there that are basically always on the hunt for these differing members of the Avengers, as well as anybody who either has information or anybody who may have some kind of powers out there. The other part of this is that Wilson Fisk has heavily fortified the entirety of the, the mayoral office, right? Where he resides. So now it's one of these things where in a lot of ways, because of the actions of the superheroes, they've almost kind of push the city of New York into becoming a like a militarized zone, right? It's kind of crazy. But regardless, of course, you end up having Wilson Fisk, who's met by the arrival of Dr. Octopus, right? Who has, of course, his other octopus henchmen and so on and so forth. And it's one of those funny things because in the end, Wilson Fisk kind of asks him like, you have what's basically a Hulk and like a Wolverine and a Ghost Rider and yourself. Why don't you just come take the throne of mayor for me? And the response of Otto is just basically saying like, because it means nothing to me, right? Like, why would I go through all that time and all that energy and all that effort to kill you in order to become mayor, right? I've got like much bigger things that I'm focusing on besides that. And it's kind of this funny thing, right? Because he says like, you've always been obsessed with power, Wilson Fisk, right? And I'm I'm happy to have you basically sit in a useless seat to shake hands and kiss babies. He's like, but I am working on making the world a better place, right? I'm working on much bigger things. The technology in the Baxter building following Reed Richards' arrest has lend uh, basically given me like marvelous technologies that I can use for my own ends, right? That made all these Octobots possible and all that kind of stuff. At the end of the day, you're focusing on small stuff as you always do because you're a small-minded person. I'm focusing on big things. And he says also something that you should be aware of. He's like, in the end, we have basically continued to deliver, you know, we want to deliver this news that like crime is again down in the city of New York, which means we've arrested your son, Butch, and then basically leaves. Now, following that, Matt Murdock, of course, goes to basically visit uh, Foggy Nelson. Remember, because Foggy Nelson is basically basically the lawyer for Luke Cage and Luke Cage announced his candidacy for mayor of the city of New York to run against Wilson Fisk because from the Avengers perspective, it's the only real way to get Fisk out of his position that if they were to successfully assassinate him, he would basically become a martyr and he would prove them right, right? He would prove himself right in saying that Avengers or superheroes are just too dangerous because it's literally superheroes assassinated a political official, <laughs> right? That's not something to be done lightly. Of course, Foggy Nelson was basically beat up by henchmen of Wilson Fisk in order to basically send a message. Now, the funny thing about this is that Foggy Nelson, as you know, those of you guys who are familiar with Daredevil, Foggy Nelson, Foggy Nelson doesn't take lip off anybody. And so it's one of those things where it's like, okay, I mean, yeah, I get what they were trying to do, but like, 
Catholic, they're gonna have to try harder than that. This whole Catholic guilt that you have, you know, Matt Murdock of, well, you know, Foggy, I never should have involved you and I, I put you in harm's way, stuff it, right? And, he's, and even he's, he's just like, I absolve you, my son. Now get out of here, right? Like, go do your thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the things I always loved about Foggy Nelson, right? But in the midst of that, of course, as Matt Murdock is leaving, he's met by the arrival of his twin brother, Mike Murdock. Now, as a bit of a refresher here, for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with Mike Murdock, we did discuss him before, so we won't go super in-depth here, that basically there was a point where Matt Murdock had brought together a team of Inhumans to essentially find a way, or at least brought, brought together a team of people, which included Inhumans, to find a way to defeat Wilson Fisk. One of those was a person named Reader, who could basically manifest anything he read and that in researching Matt Murdock and seeing the identity of Mike Murdock this led to him accidentally creating Mike Murdock now the reason why we've never really talked about him before the reason why we've never really addressed him before is because in all honesty Marvel will probably get rid of him pretty soon especially when you get around to the point where like the the Netflix Daredevil series starts to launch Marvel's probably going to kill off uh, Mike Murdock right so you know we can do a video on him if you guys are particularly interested but right now there's just not really a reason to I don't see him lasting much longer in Marvel Comics. Uh, and so it's just one of those things where, where you kind of switch over to Wilson Fisk himself. And because of what's going on here, one of the things to remember in the last video that we discussed or that we did, that you have the Purple Man, Zebediah Kilgrave, right? A person who has the ability to emit pheromones that can basically make people do whatever it is that he wants them to do, so long as their willpower isn't too high or they don't have any kind of like telepathic protection or anything along those lines. But there was also the Purple Man's children and that his children are the other half of this puzzle. The power of the purple man only goes so far but if wilson fisk has the powers of his kids and the powers of purple man then he would be nigh unstoppable and he kind of has his sights set on the office of the presidency now remember the entire motivation for why wilson fisk is doing this is because somewhere along the line basically matt murdoch had done something to make him forget daredevil's identity it's a personal grudge the the reality of this and like the equivalent of what's going on here is if like your your worst enemy in the world came to you and basically said that they they were able to successfully do something to like defeat you in some capacity and you had no real recourse that's what this is the equivalent of right it's basically kingpin essentially boxing matt murdoch in saying okay fine if you are going to strip me of the knowledge of your identity against my will right you're going to screw with my head then that's fine i will screw with your life and not just your life the lives of everybody around you this is really nothing more than a personal grudge that's something to understand here right this is not wilson fisk genuinely doing the good thing and believing he can actually make the world better no everything he's doing here harnessing the power of the purple man you know setting his sights on the office of the presidency it's all to basically get back at, at matt murdoch is really all it is right and so basically he ends up bringing together the thunderbolts so you got like john walker you've got rhino right you've got the new electro all that kind of stuff and it's one of these things something to keep in mind the thunderbolts are really more anti-heroes than they are straight up villains they're basically you know people who were at some point in line uh maybe good guys kind of not good guys and have a questionable past well i guess when i say that i'm really more referencing john walker these guys have always kind of, okay they've always kind of been bad guys i mean to a degree with john walker he's a little more anti-hero right he you know the the commission on superhuman activities basically replaced captain america with him and then he lost his mind and that led to him just like you know basically being stripped of his powers and then the mantle of captain america going back to, to steve rogers but it's again it's one of those things where like what wilson fisk is asking them to do here is to basically find the purple children and that's where the the villains really kind of draw the line it's one of the things about Marvel's villains, right? Very rarely do you ever find a Marvel villain who will do whatever they need to do, right? Who will do anything and everything. They have a few of them, like Taskmaster is a good example, right? You pay Taskmaster to kill a person, he will kill them. It doesn't really matter who they are, right? Like he will kill that person. Frank Castle to a degree, but only when it comes to villains, right? Marvel really kind of shies away from this idea that like villains will kill kids. They really sort of, they, they, don't, they don't really deal with that all too often and rightfully so. And so it's one of these things where literally John Walker's like, I mean, look, you know, I need to know what these kids did, right? I mean, why are we going after them? And so what he ends up doing, or at least what Kingpin does, is he invokes the power of the Purple Man and says, like, you will do what I tell you to do, Mr. Walker. And then, of course, with Walker's willpower really kind of being being lower than it needs to be to withstand the powers of the Purple Man, ends up going alongside that instead. And so, of course, again, following that, you basically pick up with who is, in effect, the wife of Wilson Fisk at this point in time, Typhoid Mary. Of course, we'll talk about her here in a little bit. What you actually end up doing is switching over to the prison where all the various superheroes are being held, where essentially Susan Storm using her power 
powers to make herself invisible, uh, having picked the, the lock on her collar, right? Because she had an inhibitor collar, but she ended up taking a paperclip when she was meeting with her attorney and now has used that to free herself. And then in turn steals like one of the passes off one of the guards as they walk by and then frees Reed Richards and then basically frees, you know, opens up all the other cells, which allows all the heroes to escape. Here's the thing about this, right? On the surface, you could look at that and call this a plot device. It's actually not. So Susan Storm is ridiculously capable, right? I mean, one of the things to understand here, you're talking about a woman whose power to create force fields can withstand the power of celestials. So it's no small thing. So it's not beyond the realm of possibility to believe that she could basically use a paperclip to pick a lock on her inhibitor collar. What this is also designed to do is illustrate the idiocy of just your average person in comparison to the Fantastic Four. And the reason why I say that is if you go back and you look at the events of Civil War, when the idea of creating a prison for those who wouldn't follow superhuman registration was created or developed by like Reed and Tony and Hank Pym, really Reed more than anybody else, that Reed's first thought was, we're going to be arresting some pretty heavy hitters, whether they have super strength or they have intangibility or anything like that. So it's not enough to put them in a prison. We have to put that prison in a place that they can't escape from. And that's why Prison 42 during Civil War was located in the negative zone, so that even if they somehow did manage to escape the prison, where are they going to go? That's one of the things you kind of run into here, is that in this instance, literally they locked up all these superheroes and they just put them in a prison in the water. And like, that was it, right? It just, it's, it's kind of like, okay, in the end, like a prison break is going to happen, especially when like two of the people you have locked up, right? Like Reed Richards and Tony Stark are two of the absolute smartest people in the entirety of the Marvel Universe. And so again, great big, huge fight breaks out and basically they end up, you know, seemingly being able to overtake the prison guards and start engineering their own escape. Now, one of the things that goes on here and it's kind of intriguing is that you do have like the champions, right? So you've got like Ironheart and you've got uh, Kamala Khan, Miss Marvel, and you got like Viv, right? Like Vision's daughter, which honestly, I feel like we should get caught up on the champions. I haven't read them in so long, but their comics were just fun, right? It was like Marvel's Teen Titans, but better. It was, it was just great. <laughs> <laughs> I just loved it, right? There's a great big huge fight, even with Miles, right? There's a great big huge fight where like they're all involved in a conflict with Rhino. And it's one of those things where like Rhino basically is, is like he's here and he was like, look, like put on put on these, like basically put on these discs, right? Like put on these on these things. Um and ultimately when that happens, the the bots themselves or the drones are basically designed in such a way to where they don't attack anybody with a Thunderbolt badge. And when the question is asked, Rhino, why are you giving us Thunderbolt badges so these thrones uh, these, these drones won't attack us? The response of Rhino is, look, like, I know I'm a bad guy, right? Like, I have not done very good things over the course of my life. I've basically just been a horrible human being. Anytime you ever saw me, I was committing some kind of a crime. But what Wilson Fisk is asking us to do to find some kids and to bring those kids in who seemingly haven't done anything wrong, not even I can, can follow those orders, right? Not even I can abide that, right? It's just, that's a line that I just won't cross. It's cool. It's, it's, a, it's a great little thing. I mean, is this like a Rhino redemption arc? No. It's just basically designed to illustrate that the kinds of things that Wilson Fisk is asking people to do are things that not even villains are willing to do. More so than that, it's showing there's trouble in paradise, right? The foundations by which Wilson Fisk is building his empire were never stable to begin with. And now that instability is showing in the fact that it's starting to crack. So it's really, really awesome to see. What you also end up getting in the aftermath of this is that Miles basically ends up racing off to the rest of the Avengers and then telling them like Kingpin is after the purple children, right? He's after the kids of the Purple Man. And that while I was told by Rhino, and sure, I guess Rhino's not necessarily the most credible force, the guy saved our life, right? He could he could kill us all with the greatest of ease if he chose to, but he saved us. And so if this is true, and Wilson Fisk is going after the Purple Children, having them under his control, being able to use their powers, he'll dominate the world, right? He'll be able to take everything over. And so it's one of those crazy things, because what you end up getting here is, this is this is the just a crazy moment. You switch over to Wilson Fisk. And Wilson Fisk, of course, always has having the staff next to him, which basically allows him to channel the powers of the Purple Man, is met by Typhoid Mary. Now, Typhoid Mary, she's been around in Daredevil comics for a long, long time. She's had some great story arcs and she's had some awful story arcs. She's like every comic book character ever. She's never had like 100% great arcs 100% of the time. <laughs> That never happens. But Typhoid Mary is a person who basically has multiple personality disorder, right? She's got multiple personalities in her head, some of which have access to her powers and others don't. And her powers 
change depending on which personality has taken over, right? So like telepathy or telekinesis or the ability to manipulate fire. Imagine Legion, but with far fewer personalities in his head and a far more limited uh, breadth of power at his disposal. And that's basically tied for Mary, right? She's a mutant, essentially. And so because of this, the, the, the interest between the two and what's kind of intriguing is that one of the things Kingpin says is he kind of asks the question, like, why can't I stop doing this, right? Why hold on to these things that cause me nothing but pain? My hatred, my position, I'm so consumed by power and revenge, but I have you. I think our fiery beginning and how it gave way to something more powerful, more beautiful. I think back on the first time we made love after battle, and now I find I no longer need that battle to find that level of satisfaction. And so, so in the end, Typhoid says like, I feel the same thing, right? I feel the same way. She says, even though I don't even really remember our first time, years of treatments and trauma have robbed me of so much, but I hold on to the feeling of when we were first together. And so Wilson Fisk in turn says, I wish we both had those memories. It doesn't feel fair. I wish you could remember. And he invokes the power of the purple man when he does. And Typhoid Mary remembers everything. She remembers everything about her own past. Now, she doesn't run from Wilson Fisk, right? She, she doesn't like leave him, right? It's just like, she recalls everything. She's like, oh my God, what a gift. And so this is, this is a whole change to the power of the purple man. Remember, the power of Zebediah Kilgrave has only ever been used historically in Marvel Comics to dominate the wills of others. But here's something to understand. Here's something to keep in mind here. We only ever saw his powers used that way because he only ever used them that way. It wasn't as though Zebediah Kilgrave was a guy who was trying to find a way to make the world a better place and he just simply couldn't do it because his powers wouldn't let him. The guy's always been a dick, right? Like Zebediah Kilgrave has always just been a horrible human being who used his powers for like personal gratification and for the betterment of himself based on his own selfish desires. We've never seen an instance when anybody ever used the powers of the Purple Man to basically get other people to remember. And it kind of makes sense right? If the purple man's powers, even if they're only by pheromone, can be used to make people do things and even make people believe things, then it would stand to reason the powers of the purple man can be used to make people remember things. And so in the, in, in, basically understanding that, right? And coming to that realization, Fist says like, I need air, right? I need space. The weight of years is crushing me. The weight of hate that I so desperately need to let go of. And he says, he literally holds this thing in his hand and says, remember. And this is when he recalls the identity of Matt Murdock as Daredevil. The question you really have to ask here is, what else is Wilson Fisk remembering? Because he is beset on all sides by deception and trickery and lies. So what's going to happen when he recalls everything that's actually the truth and realizes how much he's been lied to. I gotta tell you guys, this story just gets better and better. So, Devil's Reign, right? This is amazing. Remember when I told you guys about Mike Murdock? That's probably what's gonna happen here, or at least seems like it's happening here. So initially, coming off the heels of the last video that we did, it was basically Kingpin using the powers of the Purple Man on himself to make him remember that Matt Murdock is Daredevil, right? That's one of the things that I wanna kinda reiterate here, is keep in mind, everything that's happening in Devil's Reign is because of the fact that King Pin could not remember what Daredevil's identity was, but knew that he knew at some point in time. And that because Daredevil had taunted him, he came to the, really the, the realization, not so much a decision, that Daredevil had stripped him of his own identity. And so the result of this is that Kingpin's basically been harboring a grudge ever since. With this information coming back, now it's a blood vendetta, right? It's not even just like, I need to know. Now it's Daredevil's gotta die, right? And I mean, it all kind of rushes back to him. And for him, it's a massive betrayal, right? One of the highest order. And so when he's told the Thunderbolts have basically located the children of the Purple Man, remember, they all basically share a portion of his power, and that if Purple Man absorbs the powers of his children, his powers heighten several times over. When he's told, we've located where the children are, but they've basically dominated in an older woman, and they are living inside of a residential building, the response of Kingpin is, then go do it, right? Go grab them, casualties be damned. I don't care how many people die. Grab those kids and bring them in. And so switching over to the Purple Children, of course, they're basically trying to figure out exactly what it is that they're going to do. The goal is to free Zebediah Kilgrave, but what essentially ends up happening is, of course, there's a knock on the door. When they open it, it is John Walker, right? U.S. agent there is part of the Thunderbolts there to bring them in. And when they try to use their powers, of course, because there's essentially mental blocks in place and partially because of his willpower, that he ultimately is able to overpower their abilities, that this essentially turns into the rest of the Thunderbolts jumping in and then Electro essentially shocking the entirety of the Purple Kids and knocking them 
unconscious. Now, at that point, that's when you get into the involvement of the champions, and it just kind of makes it makes good sense, right? I mean, I have a hard time believing that anybody who's reading Marvel Comics would support the Avengers showing up and basically pummeling the Purple Kids, right? Just beating up children. No one's really going to be okay with that. <laughs> and so essentially, it's the champions jumping in as a way to basically save their Purple Children. Now, I have to believe that one of the things that Chip Zdarsky is toying with here is the possibility that we could actually see the Purple Children stepping in and becoming in some capacity involved with the champions. But the champions are basically just the teenage superheroes or the most popular teenage superheroes in Marvel Comics, right? That you got Kamala Khan, you've got Miles Morales and Sam Alexander Nova and a couple others, just the young popular superheroes, right? They're kind of like the cool kids table when it comes to the superhero community. Uh, but basically being there and saving them, right? Helping to rescue the Purple Children. It's one of those things where it's like, we could potentially have them there. Now, where the rest of the team, right? What's left of the Avengers essentially goes to face off against the Thunderbolts, suddenly Abomination arrives on the scene. Now, here's the thing. We never really have done a whole lot of coverage when it comes to uh, Emil Blonsky, right? Covering Abomination and talking about his character. He's not necessarily on par with the Incredible Hulk insofar as like the Incredible Hulk gets stronger, the more the, the angrier he gets, but the Abomination is no slouch. He's more than enough for everybody here. The other thing about this is that he's basically a criminal with a badge. And because of the fact that Kingpin is approaching this from a kind of by whatever means necessary approach, it means that that Abomination has essentially permission to kill the superheroes if he has to. And he will. That's one of the big things, right? Abomination would more than overpower these superheroes and basically kill them all. And so where the Purple Children are essentially captured by Abomination, the, the whole thing is like, we have to go, right? Like Miles Morales and all of them are like, we have to leave. We can't stay here, you know? And with the response of Jessica Jones, it's like, no, 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 we can't leave the kids here. The like Miles Morales is like, you know, I totally get it, right? I mean, but that's abomination, right? We'll save the kids at some point in time, but we can't do that if we're dead and he will kill us. So we have to leave right now. Now, at this point, we switch over to a combination or I guess a conversation between Mike Murdoch and Butch. And the thing about this is it's actually a reference to the events from Daredevil Volume 6 Annual Number 1 in 2020. And what it does is it references the existence of a Nornstone. Now, technically speaking, Mike Murdoch kind of has the Nornstone in his possession, but not necessarily. The Nornstone was actually in the possession of Parker Robbins of The Hood. And as you guys know, The Hood is one of those guys where he's just, he's always had his hands on everything. He's had the casket of ancient winners. He's had a Nornstone. He's had the Infinity Gauntlet at one point in time. The guy's had all kinds of stuff, right? He's just one of these guys where by whatever manner and whatever means, he usually just ends up doing some crazy things. <laughs> Parker Robbins is a really cool character, and I really hope he joins the MCU one day, like as the hood. But the Nornstone, as it's explained to us in terms of its use, which is seemingly what's going to apply here from Daredevil Annual, that Parker Robbins describes the Nornstone as basically being something that can rewrite reality. Now, while the Nornstones have been depicted in different ways over the years in Marvel Comics. In uh, Spider-Man, or I guess Symbiote Spider-Man Crossroads number four, one of the things that was given to us is that the Nornstones were seemingly created by the Celestials in the early days of the universe in order to allow the Celestials to explore other realities, to basically leave the universe and explore other universes. So essentially the Nornstones were keys to the door that allowed them to access the multiverse. Whether or not that's still a part of Marvel's continuity, I'm not 100% sure because the practical use of the Nornstones has changed so much over the years that they're not really based or rooted in their original intention. In more recent years, the Nornstones have just kind of become synonymous with the Asgardian mythos, right? So Thor and Odin and all that kind of stuff, especially when you look at stories like uh, Thor Disassembled or Thor Ragnarok, as you, as you know it. But the thing about this is that if this stone truly does have the ability to rewrite reality, that it was presented or at least uh, discussed by Parker Robbins with Mike Murdoch as what was effectively a one-off, right? Like a one more day kind of thing, right? You can use it once, but it draws too much heat. So if you use it, make sure it's a big thing, right? It'll just draw a lot of attention from all the wrong people. So it almost kind of seems like to a degree, Mike Murdoch has an ace in the hole, which is kind of hunting for it to a degree. But again, it's one of those things where he doesn't really seem to believe in that kind of stuff, you know, and, and so on and so forth. But regardless, you switch back over to Kingpin, of course, meeting with uh, Dr. Octopus and his alternate reality variants, right? The Incredible Hulk, Dr. Octopus and Wolverine and, and Ghost Rider, right? Those variants of him. And with the power of the Purple Children 
being sent directly into Zebediah Kilgrave that the response of, of uh, Otto Octavius is, okay, Kingpin, now you have the power you need in order to win the election. And his response is, I don't care about the election, right? The election isn't really relevant to me. And then he says, do you know the reason why it is that Spider-Man keeps defeating you all the time? And where Otto's like, I don't know, he says, because you think short term. You never think about the bigger picture. And this is true because what happens here is that with Otto Octavius being carried away with his own machinations, he never gave any thought to Kingpin plotting against him. And so while he has his variants here, Kingpin, who's still in possession of the Purple Man's power, seizes control of the variants of Otto Octavius and then has them throw Otto out of a building, right? Like out of the building itself. Then he directly instructs Zebediah Kilgrave, who has an inhibitor collar on, so his powers can be used. They can't really run awry. But in effect, it allows Kingpin to basically dominate uh, Zebediah Kilgrave, or at the very least, Kilgrave possibly doing it of his own accord. He unleashes them on the city and just says, kill every superhero you can find. It doesn't matter who they are. Kill them all. Every single superhero. Now, this brings into sharp relief the danger of Zebediah Kilgrave. I've been saying this for the longest time. Yes, Kilgrave was really, really cool in Jessica Jones. And in fact, he was the best part of that show. But the reality of Zebediah Kilgrave is he's a massive threat, right? He is an Avengers movie threat if the MCU ever decides to change their tune and make another Avengers film. He could be a legitimate contender because all it would take is for him to like walk into Avengers mansion and just say everybody kill yourselves and with the exception of somebody like the incredible hulk who you could actually finagle to fall under the control of kilgrave they would all die right that's the level of power kilgrave has or he goes into the avengers mansion and takes over the team and in the movie it plays out where he uses the avengers to conquer the world it's not outside the realm of possibility he is a highly slept on but ridiculous ridiculously overpowered character if you write him the right way and put him in the right circumstance, right? The guy could easily hold a movie on his own. The other part of this is that for the various members of the uh, of the, the Purple family, as well as, or I guess the Purple children, as well as the Avengers themselves, that at the end of the day, they don't really want to see the Avengers screw up. And in fact, there's one point where a discussion is had between, uh, between Luke Cage and Daredevil, uh, basically with Joseph, one of the Purple children. And what they tell him is like, the Purple Man is is 100% evil. The only time, the only reason the Purple Man hasn't used his powers to just inflict mass death and destruction is because it just doesn't suit his agenda. But he could, right? He's done nothing but destroy people's lives. That's all he does. He just satisfies his own personal gratification and cares nothing about the people that he affects. And the result of this is that he says, the only way you're going to be able to, de to defeat him is to kill him. You're going to have to. You're going to have to kill Purple Man. Of course, these guys basically being superheroes, Murdoch says, I totally get what you're saying, but we're not going to kill him. Right? He's like, that's what separates us from them. We help people. We save lives. But again, it's that philosophical discussion that we've brought up time and time again. What happens when you come across someone who can't be saved? Every single time they get out, they inflict mass destruction and harm. Is it one of those things where it's, well, we just lock them in prison for the rest of their lives. Is that really any better than killing them? You're basically just, I mean, it, in some places, depending on who you talk, to and what psychological studies you read, uh, death would actually be a more forgiving punishment, right? You guys ever get a chance, look up the psychological studies that deal with the idea of, um, of what is it, solitary confinement and how it'll totally screw you up. Executing them is preferable. They're, they're kind of coming from this perspective with somebody like Purple Man and saying, no, we shouldn't kill him. We should just lock him up for the rest of his life. Some would argue that's cruel and unusual punishment, right? You'd be better off just killing him. But regardless, it's just one of those things where it's, it's kind of a philosophical debate back and forth between whether or not it's okay to kill a villain that refuses to be redeemed. And so ultimately what ends up happening here is of course you basically have a coming together of the various autos and so on, right? Who just basically realize that like, you know, now that they're out of the influence of the purple man, the powers wear off and that they kind of regain their normal selves and they're there just in time to face off against the Avengers who of course jump in. And so now it's essentially all the forces of Kingpin versus all the forces of the Avengers, which leads to a mighty fight, right? Like a mini civil war conflict, but a really cool conflict nonetheless, right? It's, it's just, it's really, really awesome because what you end up getting is Spider-Man says, sorry, Otto, as usual, you don't rate very high on my list of priorities unless you've seen a certain purple man running around. We'd love to talk to him. And this voice seemingly comes out of nowhere and says, of course, as long as you don't mind it being a group conversation. And this is what makes things ridiculously difficult for the Avengers. And it's one of the things that makes Kilgrave so cool. He seized control of the city of New York. Like ultimately they're like, he's got everybody, right? Like all these innocent people. 
people. Just all these people are here and they're all descending on the Avengers. What do you do here, right? Because each one of these people controlled by the Purple Man will, under the influence of the Purple Man, fight to the death in order to keep him alive. So how do you defeat the Purple Man without harming any innocent civilians? I don't know the answer to that question because what we end up doing is switching over to Mike Murdock that once he seems to get into his place that, or at least maybe Matt's place, that what this is is of course the whole the whole thing being torn apart. He ends up calling Butch, believing Butch is looking for the Norn Stone that allows to rewrite reality and all that kind of stuff. But when that happens, he's met by the arrival of Kingpin. Now remember, Mike Murdock is the twin brother of Matt Murdock, who was basically created into existence accidentally by an inhuman that could bring to life anything they read. And because Mike was an identity that Matt had used at one point in time, Mike was accidentally brought into existence by that guy's ability to rewrite reality. The problem is Kingpin doesn't know this. Kingpin looks at, at, at Mike Murdock and believes he's Matt. Now, part of this could also be because Kingpin is just absolutely incensed. Like if he was more logical and more reasonable, he'd be able to understand what's actually going on here in this situation. But the truth about it is that he doesn't, right? He doesn't, he's just, he's so pissed off that at the end of the day, he sees nothing but absolute hatred and vitriol for Matt Murdock that when he looks at Mike, he sees Matt. Now, one of the things that we said at the beginning of this story, we were kind of explaining the nature of Mike Murdock is that he'd been around for a little while, but most likely what would happen is that things would go in a direction to where Marvel would basically write him out. And that's like that's exactly what looks like it happens here. That literally because what's going on, because he believes it's Matt, he takes all his anger out on Mike, believing uh, that he's basically been betrayed, just screaming at him like no more, right? Like no more stuff. And just basically seemingly beats him to death when somebody walks in and sees him doing it. And he simply just says no more, right? Kingpin loses his mind and beats who he believes to be Daredevil to death. In the last issue, we basically picked up, or at least we had this event where the purple man who was basically being directed by Wilson Fisk had essentially ensnared a good chunk of the people in Manhattan. Not all of them, right? Not everybody, but a lot of them. Like certainly enough that the Avengers have to face off against them. Now there's also people like Wolverine, different things like that. Now, this is a bit of an inconsistency here. And here's the reason why. So when it comes to the powers of the purple man, remember they're basically a result of pheromones. And so that's why people like Wilson Fisk can overcome the power of the purple man because their willpower is strong enough. Wolverine technically should not be ensnared. The other thing that we have to keep in mind though is that this is not Wolverine from the main Marvel universe. This is Dr. Octopus Wolverine. And so looking at that and looking at like the Dr. Octopus Incredible Hulk, both of which are from alternate realities, that seemingly they have the same nature and structure of like Wolverine and the Incredible Hulk, but they lack the components that would help them to resist the power of the purple man. So it is kind of a way for Chip Zdarsky to basically say, maybe in some form or fashion, Wolverine could potentially be corrupted by the Purple Man. Uh, although given Marvel's traditional history, again, that's not something we would readily see. So I felt like that was something worth pointing out because I imagine a lot of people who didn't pick up on the fact that this is like the Dr. Octopus alternate reality version of Wolverine would be like, that doesn't make any sense. Wolverine in the main Marvel universe should not be caught up by the Purple Man. You're right, it's just a different version of the character. But the bigger thing that goes on here is that the superheroes who are not in snared by the purple man have to contend with like the average person, right? Just your, your normal average Joes. And that's kind of a big deal because they have to basically keep them at bay. They have to fight them off, but they don't want to hurt them at the same time, which is kind of the benefit of the purple man here, because it's basically taking the nature of the superheroes and using it against them. The bigger thing that goes on here though, is that in the middle of this fight, Matt Murdock gets a call that Mike has been killed. Now, here's the thing. When, when Matt Murdock gets this call, he's basically told that Matt is dead, right? Because at the end of the day, Kirsten McDuffie does not know that Matt Murdock is Daredevil. But as you guys know, Matt's twin brother is Mike. And so while Matt's like, okay, that's weird because I'm alive and well, he immediately picks up on the fact that what Kirsten actually saw was Wilson Fisk killing Mike Murdock. And so that's when he realizes his brother's basically dead. Now, we called this, right? Like, <laughs> we said Mike Murdock was going to die. We said, like, it's only a matter of time before it happens because he's a character that doesn't really serve a purpose anymore. And so Marvel was like, we'll just get rid of him and just replace him with somebody else. It's one of the things, right? You read Marvel comics enough, uh, long enough, you can figure out where they're going with particular characters when they stop using them for anything significant after a while. But the death of Mike is not limited to how it impacts Matt. In fact, it'll also, uh, it'll also impact impact the son of Kingpin, Butch, and we'll talk about him here in a little while. But again, doing what they can here, at least the various superheroes facing off against these various villains, Daredevil ultimately ends up taking
taking off to basically find Wilson Fisk with the intention of killing Wilson Fisk because Wilson Fisk had killed his brother, Matt. Now, this is an important thing. And in a lot of ways, while it does kind of focus on sort of a, a coming to of this battle between like Wilson Fisk and Daredevil, the reality is that this is a long time coming. And while there have been stories in the past where like Matt Murdock just start, just gives Wilson Fisk the business for any number of reasons, this has a kind of finality to it, right? Like the final fight between like Batman and the Joker or like the final fight between Superman and Lex Luthor. This kind of seems to fit that mold in a lot of different ways because the reality here is that Wilson Fisk has done a lot of things to get back at, at Daredevil. He's dumped his identity to the world. Technically, it was Karen Page who sold the identity of, of uh, Daredevil as, uh, as Matt Murdock. But nonetheless, there's been a lot of things that Wilson Fisk has done. But this is one of those things where it's kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. Wilson Fisk, in terms of killing Mike Murdock, believing he'd actually killed Matt, at the same time doing all this stuff in terms of like outlawing superheroes and so on and so forth. It's one of those things where Matt's like enough, right? Like this is like enough is enough. This guy's got to die. Now make no mistake for Matt. It's personal, right? It's a very personal thing because Wilson Fisk going after superheroes or whatever, right? That's just Wilson Fisk doing what you ultimately would have expected him to do as the mayor of New York. It was only a matter of time. Killing the brother of Matt Murdock, that's breaking a line, right? That's crossing a line that just is not acceptable. And so from there, you basically switch over to Wilson Fisk meeting with Typhoid Mary. Now, again, the two of them are basically a couple, right? They're romantically involved with each other, but Wilson Fisk believing he'd killed Matt had told her, we're done. Like everything's done. Like it's just time to go. It's time to walk away. The problem is that as they're leaving, they're suddenly met by Elektra. Now remember, Elektra is kind of like a, a newer-ish version of, uh, of Daredevil. Now at the moment, uh, Elektra is kind of like this kind of Daredevil, kind of not, <laughs> right? She's just sort of doing her own thing. She had taken up the mantle when Daredevil was basically locked up and just hadn't given it up, right? It was just a way for Marvel to kind of be like, we're elevating Elektra beyond basically the old Frank Miller days when she was just the chick that was hot that Matt Murdock probably banged a few times and uh, she's just a really good assassin, right? And instead, like they're moving her into a different echelon where it's really her and Matt Murdock working as a team. And in reality, this is long overdue right? Like Elektra's literally been one of those characters where she's just been the same character forever. So it's cool to see Marvel, despite the fact that it's something they haven't really done since the eighties, it's cool to see Marvel just elevate her and move her in a different direction and give her like a wholly different role. That's far beyond anything she's ever done before, particularly in the realm of Daredevil comics. So I'm definitely digging that. But in the midst of this, of course, where she's going to attack Kingpin, ultimately Matt's like, no, if Kingpin dies today or when he dies today, I'll be the last thing he sees. And the crazy thing is that like, like we'll Wilson Fisk doesn't know what to do here because he thought he killed Matt. And he's like, why won't you simply just die? And ultimately, of course, the two of them end up getting into a skirmish. Now, there are a couple of things that go on. For example, like Dr. Octopus is attacked by Iron Man and basically knocked unconscious. The Fantastic Four step in and they kind of do their thing, which is cool, I guess, whatever. Uh, but like the, the thing about this and, and really one of the bigger things that take place is that one of the really the last of the Purple Man's children, essentially Joseph, ends up stepping up, right? Ends up coming into the equation. Now, one of the things that Chip Zdarsky has largely built up and has, has really been a contingent or a thing that's been going on with the Purple Children since their initial introduction is that they could potentially overpower the Purple Man. To a degree, he actually needed their powers in order to basically expand on his own. But Joseph, there was always something different about him. And so ultimately where he kind of makes his way and you've just got this knockdown drag out fight between like Wilson Fisk and, uh, and Daredevil and you've got Elektra fighting Typhoid Mary and all that kind of stuff. You've basically got the Purple Man just literally seething with power, right? I mean, just, just full of power that the question that Joseph asks once he finds them is where, where, like, where's everybody else, right? Like, where are the other kids? And that's when the purple man's like, they're dead, right? Like I have their power now and there's nothing you can do to stop me. And so it basically comes to a fight between a uh, purple man and his son. Now, this is the reason why this matters because what this really is, despite the fact that this is a crossover event in Marvel comics, and it focuses on a lot of the superheroes, it's the same thing we've been saying since the beginning. It's a daredevil story that what this does is it basically brings together and, and really ties up all these loose ends involving the Daredevil mythos that's been going on for quite some time since the return of the Purple Children and all that kind of stuff. And there's even themes of this that go all the way back into like Brian Michael Bendis' New Avengers, specifically with Luke Cage. We'll talk about him here in a second. But it's one of those things where it literally just wraps up the Daredevil mythos that's been going on for quite some time. And it just sort of resets it. And that's one of the things that I love about the idea of Devil's Reign is because under any normal circumstance, and those of you guys who 
been reading comics for a long time, you guys know, under any normal circumstance, this would have been wrapped up in a Daredevil comic. And that would have been it. It would have been Daredevil's issues such and such through such and such. And that would have been it. It's just one of those things where making it like a high profile crossover event really sort of elevates it. And it's just like, this is basically the conclusion of this era of Daredevil. And that's basically it. And that's why you could go back and read all those comics, Charles Soule and everything going all the way up until the current age, until this story. And it's one cohesive era. It's just one giant Daredevil epic. And so at the end of that, of course, again, this giant fight between uh, between Daredevil and Kingpin, it begins to come to a head when basically Daredevil's just like thrown into a car, right? And like really injured. And then he grabs the staff of Kingpin, which contains a portion of the Purple Man's power. And when he says like, I want you to suffer, Kingpin, like I want you to suffer for all the things that you've done. I want you to think about all the lives that you've destroyed. He's just like done, right? And then just goes back to attacking Daredevil. Because again, Wilson Fisk's fortitude, right? His, his just willpower overrides the power of the Purple Man. And that's why I say Kilgrave is a really, really cool villain, but he only works under certain circumstances. That's why like the Jessica Jones story in Alias by Bendis was so good is because she was just a young, naive superhero who had no idea what she was getting into when she stumbled across the path of the Purple Man because her willpower just wasn't quite there yet. She hadn't sort of, she hadn't really built herself up and gained the confidence she needed in order to overpower the influence of the Purple Man. Now she does, right? If Zebediah Kilgrave goes running up on Jessica Jones, she's going to scoff off his powers and then beat the hell out of him. That's exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> those two have beef, but it's just, it's, it's really, really cool, right? It's just one of those cool elements. And so knowing that doesn't necessarily work, then we switch over to Luke Cage because at this point, this fight between uh, Daredevil and, and Wilson Fisk is just an intense fight, just like a knockdown drag out fight. And that's why you have these moments where you have Chip Zdarsky sort of bouncing back and forth between these scenarios where like Matt Murdock cracks Kingpin across the face with his own cane, right? And literally just like, just creates these gashing wounds. And like Wilson Fisk is just pummeling, just absolutely attacking Daredevil as best he can. They're literally trying to kill each other, right? It's just decades of hatred, at least in terms of comic publication history, coming to a head in this story. But for Luke Cage, he makes this amazing moment where what he does is he basically takes his, uh, takes the device that's used to basically uh, ensure that he's not influenced by the Purple Man and he gives it to Joseph. So that way, Joseph won't be overpowered by his own father. And that's when Kilgrave is like, that's a ridiculous thing. And he says, Mr. Cage, kill my son. And that's the cool thing is because where Luke Cage looks like he's getting ready to kill him and destroy this kid, this kid starts lashing out. And what Luke Cage says is like, you're not alone, Joseph. Like you are not by yourself. I know you feel like you are, but you are not. Tap into your power, son, and use it. Now, you would look at this and you would say, okay, Luke Cage should succumb to the power of the Purple Man. There's never been an indication to show that he can't overpower him, but there actually is. So in Brian Michael Bendis's New Avengers in the first arc, right, Breakout, which I don't know if we ever covered that, but Bendis his new Avengers was phenomenal, right? It was like, it's probably one of the best Brian Michael Bendis stories ever before he lost his mind and started going into Bendis speak, before he got carried away with himself. There was a point because Kilgrave was locked away in the raft and Luke Cage was in his presence, he actually instructed Luke Cage to basically start attacking the superheroes. And if I remember correctly, Luke Cage was able to overpower it. He was able to like override the influence of the Purple Man and that was basically it. It took every ounce of inner strength for him to do it, <laughs> but he was still able to do it. But with Joseph using every ounce and, and really it's more emotion than anything else right but like tapping into this power to influence others he overrides the power of his father and by overriding the power of his dad he solidifies himself as being stronger than the purple man which is huge because of course as you would expect where daredevil is on the cusp of killing wilson fisk of course he doesn't and things wrap up pretty readily right like the the various members of the thunderbolts are arrested as you would expect the thunderbolts are always arrested right they're always just locked up and taken to a prison somewhere and until they need to be used again. And then they're basically released and they're sent out on whatever task they have to go on, right? So Marvel's version of the Suicide Squad. Uh, of course, again, Wilson Fisk is arrested. The Purple Man is basically taken away. But what it does is it clears the landscape here and it allows for a reshuffling of things because now you have Joseph as what's basically the Purple Child, you know, where he still like has his powers and that nobody else really does. He's just the last of the, the a, a person who can use the abilities of the Purple Man. So he's out there now and presumably he's gonna become a good guy. So we won't know how his story Story unfolds. I mean, presumably it'll appear in some comic. I don't really see them making a, a solo comic for him specifically, even though I would probably read it. I'd read the first couple of the first arc just to see whether or not it's good. Uh, and it may even be one of those things where 
like Jessica Jones and Luke Cage end up adopting him, right? End up taking him in and just kind of, he just goes forward and does his own thing. Wilson Fisk, where he's being arrested, you end up finding out that what's actually going on here is that Butch is one of the people who had arrested him, Butch being his son. And they basically end up taking him away to what's essentially a safe haven. Now, when he gets there, it's actually Butch bringing him to the presence of the Stromwinds. Now, here's the thing. The Stromwinds are basically new for Chip Zdarsky's work, but we don't really know a whole lot about them. All we really know is that they just kind of appeared intermittently. So like Daredevil Volume 6, Issue Number 13, they were part of, uh, of Devil's Reign. But in effect, they were the ones who have essentially gotten Wilson Fisk this far in terms of him becoming mayor, building on what happened during Secret Empire when like he was the one that was keeping New York safe and so on and so forth. They seem to be the benefactors. And so what they end up saying here is, look, like you got a couple options here, Wilson Fisk, right? The whole world knows what you did, uh, but we have a lot of reach and we have a lot of pull and we can really help, you know, these, these charges that are being brought against you, we can help them go away. The way this will work though, is that your son will basically become the kingpin in the city of New York. And then we will elevate you to the office of the presidency. We'll make you president of the United States, right? Using our finances and so on and so forth. We will get you to that spot. And that in reality, while you will be president, you'll essentially be working for us, right? Like we'll be telling you what kind of bills you need to veto, what kind of bills you need to pass, any executive orders that need to be issued. You know, make no mistake, we'll be the ones controlling the scene, but you will get what you've always wanted. You'll become president. And you get this amazing moment where Wilson Fisk, you know, where they literally go to shake his hand and he's just kind of like, this is an interesting offer. Now, it's very similar to clone conspiracy, right? When like the Jackal had shown up to Wilson Fisk with a cloned version of Vanessa and he freaked out, snapped her neck and was like, that's not my wife. That's not Vanessa. That's exactly what happens here, right? He says, my life has been successes and failures. I let my wife Vanessa down in the sense that she died and my son Richard and now to be president running a country. He says, how could Butch not look up to me and respect me then because remember for the longest time he didn't know butch existed and then when butch finally came around he was always trying to demonstrate that he was like an effective man but as a guy who was essentially taking orders from the stromwinds even as mayor of new york that they were the ones who got them there or at least got him there that it was always one of these things where he felt like in the eyes of his son that he was a follower that he wasn't a leader that the wilson fisk of old had largely seemed to have gone away right and now he was just doing what a good boy does and so again he says how could butch not look up to me and respect respect me then running the greatest country in the world. And he says, I've made mistakes. I won't make another. And literally he's like, Fisk bows to no one and just starts crushing everybody. Like literally starts attacking everybody. The guards, the Stromwinds, the whole nine yards. The whole time he's like crushing the hand of one of the Stromwinds. And then literally everybody just gets taken out, right? Like they're just basically done and gone. And that's when he's like, here's what's going to happen, right? He tells his son, like when his son's like, what are you doing? He's like the exact same thing you're doing. Like you're joining in here. He's like, look, a Fisk does not bow to anyone. A Fisk does not take orders from anyone. A Fisk does as Fisk pleases. And that's the way that it is because we're powerful enough because we have enough conviction. Only a fool would come to a Fisk and say, work for me and I will give you X, Y, and Z. When a Fisk knows full well, they can just take it. And he's like, that's the legacy that I leave to you. He was like, you are now the kingpin of New York. I'm out, I'm going to do my thing, but I leave you this legacy. Live up to the legacy of the Fisk. Do not let anybody out there tell you what you will or will not do. If there is something that you want, take it. And those who are too weak will let you have it. And those who are too strong will be stupid enough to challenge you. So do what you please. That's the way we as Fisks operate. He's like, after all these years, this is my gift to you, boy, your inheritance and walks away. Now, during this conversation, conversation, what he had let slip is that he had murdered Matt Murdock. And that ultimately this is when Butch realizes it was not Matt Murdock that Kingpin killed. It was Mike Murdock. It was his friend. And so as a result of that, the question's kind of up in the air. What happens next? Does Butch live up to the legacy of the Fisk or does Butch basically become a good guy and actually turn against his father? Does he become an ally of Daredevil? We're not entirely sure, but the week following this, this is when we start to get a kind of, uh, kind of follow up. This is really more of like a epilogue. Log. This is tied directly into the story and really gives us the next direction for the Daredevil series, which is that Electra Nachos and, and Matt Murdock are essentially teaming up to form the fist. That the, what they are going to do is basically become this kind of antithesis of the hand. Now, in recent years, and, and not even really recent years, but like in years past, that was the role that was played by the cast. The reality
reality of this is that they're not really a part of the picture anymore. And so because of that, something has to stand against the role of the hand, always influencing and always involving things. But the reason why the hand is chosen, make no mistake, the reason why that group is chosen as being uh, being really the, the main enemy of the fist is because this is taking Daredevil back to the old school days. It's tying back into the Frank, uh, Frank Miller days. Even if it's not necessarily retreading water, it's bringing back the classic Daredevil, but by a different means. And instead of Elektra just being some assassin out there that Matt Murdock crosses paths with and then touches naughty bits with every so often. Instead, like she's an ally, right? She's working with him and the two of them are gonna go forward with their fists and then do their whole thing. So that's cool. And I'm actually interested to see what direction this ends up going in. As for Wilson Fisk and the way this basically ends, Wilson Fisk ends up doing what he always felt like he should have done before. That the reality here is that with him operating as the kingpin of crime, that he always basically took directions from other people. That even when he was operating as kingpin and even when he was to a degree, doing his own thing. His life was motivated by trying to defeat Daredevil or something along those lines. And seemingly for the first time, he's literally taking his life under his own under his own wing and just like taking uh, taking Typhoid Mary and just like going out into the world. Where their journey takes them, I'm not entirely sure, but I would surmise the reason why they're doing this, the reason why Marvel's doing this, doesn't really have much to do with the nature of Kingpin in Marvel Comics. It's because Kingpin's in the MCU and the last we saw him, he was shot in the face by Echo, uh, at least presumably anyway, right? The camera panned off and then we heard a gunshot and then maybe Kingpin's dead, but supposedly he's gonna come back is what everybody's saying, right? He's supposed to reappear in the MCU series in the actual Marvel Cinematic Universe series on Disney+, Plus, which fingers crossed is gonna be mature just like it was on, on Netflix. And likely when that happens, they'll bring him back in some capacity similar to that, right? So when that series launches or when, yeah, when that series launches on Disney+, Plus and like the Kingpin returns, this is when you'll see Marvel be like, the Kingpin's back in the comics, you know? And like, that's gonna be their whole thing, right? So with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this to an end. I did love Devil, uh, Devil's Reign. Don't get me wrong. I thought it was a phenomenal story. I mean, it's just beautifully written and beautifully done. Uh, I, I thought it was incredible. But let me know what you guys think down in the comment section. Thank you all for watching, and I will catch you all later. Peace.